Let me do the um, let me do the COVID uh, yeah. notice first. So hang with me here as chair. <clears throat> I need to read this into the record. Uh, so uh, as chair of the Concord uh, New Hampshire Planning Board due to the COVID-19 crisis uh, and in accordance with Governor Sununu's emergency order number 12 pursuant to executive order 202004, this board is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to the meeting which will was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, this is to confirm that we are a providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possibilities by video or other electronic means. We're utilizing the Zoom platform for this electronic meeting. All members of the board have the ability to con communicate contemporaneously during the meeting through the Zoom platform and the public has, a, has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in the meeting through clicking the following website, which is uh, https forward slash uh, zoom dot us forward slash j forward slash seven five four zero seven six six two nine or by dialing the following phone number nine two nine two zero eight six zero nine nine and entering the password seven five four zero seven six six two nine for those calling in who want to provide public testimony please dial star nine to alert the host that you'd like to speak the host will unmute you during the public hearing portion of the meeting uh, b providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting we previously gave notice to this meeting uh, of pub we pub excuse me we previously gave notice to the public of how to access the meeting using Zoom and instructions are provided on the city's website at www.concordnh.gov forward slash 273 forward slash planning dash board and see providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there's a problem with access. If anyone has a problem, please call 603 five six eight eight five one five or send an email to planning at concordnh.gov and d adjourning the meeting if the public is unable to access the meeting in the event the public is unable to access the meeting we will adjourn the meeting and have it rescheduled at that time please note that all votes are taken during this meeting shall be done by a roll call vote when each member states their presence to this meeting also please state whether you're whether there is anyone in the room with you during the meeting which will be required under the right to know law with that, let's uh, start the meeting. Take a roll call attendance. Madam Clerk, could you call the roll? No? Yes? Heather? I was on mute. Chairman Woodfin? Here, and I'm alone in the room. Okay. Councillor Pierce? Councillor Pierce disappeared. I don't know if you were trying to call, come on mute, but you. I am here. Uh, I am home. I am alone. Uh, Member Regan? Present and I'm alone. Uh, Member Santa Cruz? Present and alone. Member Hicks? <clears throat> I am here and alone in the room. Member Rosenberg? Here and alone. Member Smithmeyer? Here and alone. And that's all we've got. Okay, um, so we will uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, Heather, do you want to, I don't know how you want to handle the previous meeting. Uh, we do, we need a motion to... Um, uh, I'll, I'll move that we seal the minutes from the non-public session held prior to this meeting. I'll second. Those John Regan. So Thank that you. motion's been uh, motion's been made and seconded uh, by roll call. Uh, all those in favor? I'll abstain. I was not at the meeting, so I will abstain. Uh, Member Hicks. Here. I mean, I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Member Santa Cruz. I. Member Rosenberger. You're on mute, Teresa. I'm oh, sorry. He, yes. Uh, Member Regan. Aye. Member Pierce. Aye. Member Smithmeyer. Aye. <clears throat> okay. With that, we'll move into the uh, public session of the meeting. We will welcome Jeff Santa Cruz to our to our board. Uh, Jeff's uh, a new member uh, of the board and uh, has graciously agreed to to partake in our uh, in our monthly excursions down uh, the planning road. So Jeff, welcome aboard. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll move on to approval of the minutes. Would someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the November 18th, uh, 2020 planning meeting as uh, as submitted? So uh -oh. approval. A uh, motion's been made by Councilor Pierce. Did I get a second by Matt Hicks? Yeah. Okay, all those in favor by roll call? For Hicks? 
Yes. Chairman Woodfin? Yes. Councilor Pierce? Yes. Member Regan? Yes. Member Santa Cruz? I was not here, so wouldn't I need oh, to right. abstain? Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Member Rosenberger? Uh, yes. Member uh, Regan? I think I yes, said, again. Sorry. My boxes that's are getting mixed up. Uh, Member smith -Meyer. I didn't change my mind. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's everybody. Okay, with that, uh, minute, uh, minutes from the prior meeting have been approved. We'll get a quick agenda overview here. Nothing has been pulled from the consent agenda yet. Um, items, if anyone's here for item 7H, which is North Point, uh, major site plan approval, the motion, uh, motion's been made, or, or do we need to make a motion to table that to no certain date, Heather? Correct. Okay, so we will, uh, we will do that. Can we do them both together, 7H and 7I? You should not. Okay, so we'll make a motion. Uh, I'll make that motion to table uh, item 7H on our agenda to no specific date. Would someone like to second that motion? I'll second. Okay, seconded by Councilor Pierce. Uh, all those in favor by roll call. Uh, Member Woodfin, I mean Chairman Aye. Woodfin. Aye. Uh, Member Hicks. Aye. Uh, Councilor Pierce. Aye. Member Regan. Aye. Member Santa Cruz. Aye. Member Rosenberger? Aye. Uh, Member Smith Meyer? Aye. Okay, so uh, the application under 7H, North Point Engineering, um, on behalf of Barbara Moreno, has been tabled to an, no uncertain date. Let's move to 7I, which is also, uh, we'll need a motion to uh, continue this application to the January 20th meeting. I'll make that motion to continue the application to the 20th of January. Would someone like to second that motion? I'll second. And seconded by Councillor Pierce. All those in favor by roll call. You're muted, Heather. Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Councillor Pierce? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Uh, Member Rosenberger? Aye. Member Smith Meyer? Aye. Uh, and David Fox has just joined us. Um, is, I, I, I think I'm we're good sure. with we're good with the quorum, so we'll move on from that. Okay. And see okay. David after the fact. Maybe in a moment we'll just allow yep. him to come in and solve yep. if he's in wrong room. Yep. And Member Foss has just joined us. Okay, and we'll do the same with Carol then at that point. Okay, so that moves us uh, through item four, which is the agenda overview. Uh, David and Carol, we will not be hearing item seven H and 7i on the agenda tonight. So you can scratch those off your agenda. The 7h has been moved to no uncertain date and 7i, which is bricks more, uh, has been moved to the January 20th meeting. Uh, so with that, we'll recognize David Fox and Carol uh, Foss have joined the meeting as full members. Um, and we'll move on on our agenda to item five, uh, which is a determination of completeness component for Jarbell Realty. If you could read that into the record, Madam Clerk. Jarbell Realty LLC requests major site plan approval for conversion of an existing non-residential structure to a five unit residential and commercial use at 189 North Main Street in the urban commercial district. Um, staff does recommend the application be determined complete, not a development of regional impact and set for public hearing uh, January 20th. Okay, so uh, staff has uh, done the, the homework, determined the application complete, not a development of regional impact, and uh, would like to set the public hearing for January 20th. Would someone like to make a motion to find the application complete, set the public hearing for the 20th of January? So moved. Second. Motion's been that was made. Carol seconded. Seconded by Carol. Um, all those in favor by roll call? Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Councillor Pierce? Aye. Member Rosenberger? Aye. Uh, Member Fox? You're uh, you're muted, David. You need to... Now it looks like, there you go. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. okay, sorry about that. No, no Uh <laughs> Member smith -Meyer? Yes. And Vice Chair Foss? Yes. Okay, so that uh, that will be determined complete, and we'll set the public hearing for the 20th of January. Moves us on uh, to item six on our agenda for tonight, our ADR. Uh, 
by consent. So design review applications by consent. Uh, members of the audience, uh, if you're here regarding uh, items 6A, 6B, 6C, and 6D, if you'd like to speak uh, either uh, opposed to that or in favor of that or have anything you'd like to say regarding that those uh, those applications. If not, we'll address them by consent and uh, approve them uh, uh, with architectural design review uh, comments uh, in entirety. Uh, any member of the board have any uh, applications that they would like to pull from the consent agenda? No? Heather, do you have anybody in the audience that wishes to uh, discuss? No, I do not. Okay, so we will address them by consent. Would someone like to make a motion to approve uh, items under the 6A, B, C, and D by consent with uh, architectural design review comments? So move, move. Motion second. Been made by uh, Councilor Pierce and seconded by John Regan. All those in favor by roll call? Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Member Pierce, I mean, Councilor Pierce, excuse me. Aye. Member Rosenberger? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Member Smithmeyer? Aye. And Member Foss? Aye. Okay, uh, those, uh, those applications I'll pass uh, on the consent agenda item and it'll move us on to our fun portion of the evening, our public hearing section of the evening. So uh, those of you watching along thinking this moves right along, this is where things kind of grind down to a halt. So we will uh, <laughs> we will gladly welcome you to stick with us for a while here and get through our uh, get through our agenda items on uh, 7A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And again, if you weren't here at the beginning, 7H from North Point Engineering and 7I of the Novus Group on behalf of Bricksmore have been uh, removed from tonight's agenda and will be heard at a later date. So um, Madam Clerk, could we uh, read item 7A into the record? Landmark sign on behalf of Genesis Healthcare Company requests conditional use permit approval for two previously installed freestanding directional signs at 227 and 239 Pleasant Street in the Institutional District. Um, these are signs that were basically already installed uh, and reviewed by ADR. ADR made some recommended changes, which they did make. Um, so this is kind of retroactively uh, form, you know, making official. Right, okay, is the applicant here? If, would they like to speak? I see a hand up there if we wanna bring them in. Um, could we get a quick staff update on this or was that the quick staff update? That was the quick staff update, but Sam can jump in if I missed anything. I've never seen so many times I've seen Genesis Healthcare for sign applications, but let Sam, if you got anything else to add, feel free. Uh, nope, that's that pretty much sums it up. Uh, the signs before you, uh, they do reflect ADR's comments. Okay, so the signs that are that are we're approving do represent all the uh, concerns the ADR had regarding the names and the size, yes. and they couldn't do anything about the color. I get that, but um, they did what they could. Uh, okay, was there somebody that wanted to talk about this, Heather? There are two hands raised. Let's see, we've got Jason Moorhead, who I'm allowing to talk, and Jim H., who I'm allowing to talk. Both of you both of you should be allowed, able to speak now. Okay. I'm, just, I'm Jason Moorhead with Landmark Sign Group. I was just letting you know that I'm here and okay. present. Okay, great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, and uh, Jim? Yeah, this is Jim. This is Jim Hochberg, I uh, live at 230 Pleasant Street, which is right across the street from Pleasant View, or Genesis Healthcare. Okay. Um, just wondering, are the sign locations in ex exactly where they currently are, or are they gonna move or anything like that? We're just wondering about the views from our property and such. Um, the signs have already been erected, so this is a, a retroactive approval, ah. so they will be where they are now. Okay, that's all we needed to know, thank you. That's Can a I good thing, that's a good thing, Jim. Can we just, what do you need, Heather? I just wanted to get his last name I'm, for the record. It, it's Hochberg, H-O-C-H-B-E-R-G. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And yes, that's fine. Uh, they're, they're, where they currently are, we honestly can't see them from our properties. Our concern was that they'd be moved further up the street or whatever, and, and it'd just be a, a viewing thing. But if it's if it's where they're currently located, that's that's fine. Great. Thank you. Uh, any comments thank from you. the board? Any member of the board or any member of... Uh, Anybody else have a comment or concern regarding these? I know we had, we voiced our opinions loud and clear when they came before us before, so uh, it's good to see that they've been changed and appropriately uh, tweaked as needed. So would someone like to make a motion to uh, 
to, well, let's see what we got here. Hang on just a second. So we've got a recommendation to grant ADR approval for the sign, uh, for the design of two directional signs uh, as submitted at 227 and 239 Pleasant Street. Uh, can we do these, Heather, as, as one, uh, one motion and one approval to grant the ADR approval and the CUP? Um, it should really be two separate motions, I believe. I'm not sure. I don't okay. know if I... Lisa? Yes, if you could do two separate, they're two separate okay. um, we'll, items. Uh, Thank we'll you. We'll do that. So we will uh, we'll look at 1.1 in your package, which is the grant ADR approval for the design of the two directional signs. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to grant ADR approval as outlined? So moved. Second. Carol Foss made that uh, motion, and uh, I believe Matt Hicks seconded all by all in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Councilor Pierce? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Fox? Yes. Member Rosenberg? Uh, aye. Uh, Member Smithmeyer? Aye. Vice Chair Foss? Aye. Okay, and uh, item 1.2 in the packet is to grant the CUP approval for the installation of the two directional signs uh, as submitted. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to grant that CUP approval as outlined? Move approval. Second. Uh, motion's been made by John, Steck, uh, John Regan and seconded by David Fox. Uh, all those in favor by roll call? Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Councilor Pierce? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Uh, Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Uh, Member Fox? Aye. Member Rosenberger? Aye. Member Smithmeyer? Aye. Vice Chair Foss? Aye. Okay, that motion carries. So uh, we'll move on to item 7B, if we could read 7B into the record. If Moran, on behalf of Unitil, requests two conditional use permits to allow wetland buffer impacts and shoreline protection district buffer impacts for replacement of utility poles and wires uh, within the line 37 utility right of way between McCoy Street and Village Street in the industrial district, the open space residential district, the medium density residential districts, and the neighborhood residential districts. Um, staff does recommend this be determined complete, uh, not a development of regional impact, and open the public hearing. Okay, so we have <laughs> Yes. I'm a property owner along that corridor, so I think I should recuse. Yep. Yeah, okay. please. So, so did you uh, get that? We'll recognize that uh, Vice Chair Foss has recused from this conversation uh, okay. and move on uh, and recognize that uh, we have a determination of completeness component to this, that it is not a uh, development of regional impact and we want to, we will open the public hearing tonight. Would someone like to make a motion to find the application complete and open the public hearing? Uh, so moved. Second. And motion made by Councilor Pierce and seconded by John Regan. Uh, all those in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Councilor Pierce? Aye. Member Rosenberg? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Member Smithmeyer? <clears throat> Aye. There you go. Uh, okay, uh, so let's uh, uh, ask if there's an applicant here that uh, wants to uh, address this application to please make yourself known. Uh, and if we could get a quick staff update on this uh, project, that would be great. Uh, yeah, Jeremy Belanger, I just uh, allowed to speak. Let's, you want? Can we do a staff update first? I was trying to. Um, I know, sorry, sorry Beth. <laughs> the, um, it's uh, an existing utility right of way corridor. Um, staff doesn't have any there. We gave them some comments, but um, we're recommending approval um, because it is pretty much replacement within existing disturbed area. Um, Conservation Commission members did review this. There was uh, Zoom issues last week, so their meeting had to be canceled, um, but members did not have any concerns. So I, um, I don't have any concerns for recommending to you um, approval without their voting on a recommendation. You're gonna vote on their behalf, huh? Oh, I'm not voting. No, no. <laughs> I'm giving you a, a voice of confidence that- Good politician. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, uh, and you said the applicant's here, Mr. Belanger. Would you introduce yourself? Welcome to the table, and uh, if you could state your name for the record. Good evening. My name is Jeremy Belanger. I'm a licensed engineer and a senior project engineer with TF Moran. I'm joined this evening by Nate Sherwood, who's a senior design engineer with Unitil. So, as Heather stated, we're here on behalf of the Unitil 37 line rebuild project, which runs from McCoy Street down to Village Street. And this is within an existing utility uh, right away. So just a quick background, the 37 line is the main feed uh, in North Concord. It serves Boswin, Webster, Canterbury, Salisbury. Um, so it was just over 3,000 customers. Um, so the project is the replacement of the existing utility poles and overhead lines within the existing utility corridor due to the age of the infrastructure. Um, as part of the design, Unitil was able to actually reduce the number of poles within the utility corner uh, by maximizing the spans between the structures. We're actually proposing fewer poles than there are now. And so we're here before you tonight for the two conditional use permits. The first being the impacts to the wetland buffer, approximately 21,130 square feet of temporary impact. Now those temporary impacts are associated with the access down the existing utility right away um, and the placement of swamp mats. So the swamp mats are just timber matting. They're 14 feet wide by four feet long. They get placed along the path of travel and then they distribute out the load, the load so there's no point loads um, within the wetland buffer. And they just get laid right on top of the existing vegetation. So the next CUP will be for the uh, disturbance within the shoreland buffer. So that's 4,035 square feet within the 75 foot buffer along White Brook and 3,660 square feet of temporary impacts along the 250 foot uh, buffer along the Kentucky River. Um, we'll be installing sediment erosion controls using best management practices. So in addition to those swamp mats, which we be used for access, there'll be double rows of silt stock along the areas where um, the actual poles will be installed. Now the permanent impacts within the buffers are only for the installation of the poles and the guy wires. So within the wetland buffer, that's only 58 square feet. And within the shoreland buffer, it's 48 square feet of permanent impact. How um, many, 48 you said? Yeah, 48 square feet of permanent within the shoreland and 58 square feet permanent within the wetland buffer. All the rest of the proposed impacts are temporary for those access routes. Um, in addition to these two CUPs, uh, there's a couple of other permits that we've had to obtain. So we were granted a DES um, statutory permit by notification, which is essentially the wetlands permit for this type of utility project. Um, the New Hampshire Natural Heritage Bureau and New Hampshire Fish and Game have reviewed and approved the project. We also received FAA permits due to the proximity to the uh, Concord Airport. So all of those have been granted. Construction schedule, um, shooting to start uh, late March, and that's really dependent on the availability of materials. And then a conservative construction schedule of 12 to 16 weeks to complete the installation and run the new lines, um, which total just about 1.3 miles of line or 7,000 linear feet. Okay. And I believe that's all kind of the summary that we got. Great. Um, so I had a question on the fewer poles. Does fewer poles mean you're going up higher or are you going to stay at the same heights that the, the, the lines are at now? Oh, uh, they're approximately the same height. Same height. And uh, is there a clearing that's going to be done while you're going through there? So there's no proposed uh, tree clearing. It's all within the existing utility right away. Now, Unitil does have um, an existing vegetated maintenance program that mm -hmm. they conduct through all their utility corridors. Yep. So that type of uh, 
vegetative maintenance would be done in conjunction with it, but there's no okay. tree clearing. Okay. Okay. Any member of the board have a question or comment or concern regarding this application? Uh, I do. Okay. Uh, Mr. Belanger, uh, this is Earl Pierce. Are there other utilities connected to this pole, such as telephone and cable? Uh, nope. This is just the uh, electric line that's running down okay. to the existing substation down uh, adjacent to Village Street. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Any member of the audience has a question or comment or concern regarding this application, please uh, make yourself known. If not, we will close the public hearing. Heather, you don't see anybody? Oh, sorry, Carol's on there. Carol? Carol. I couldn't find a way to raise my hand. Okay, but well, I'm, you did. I, I saw would like you. to ask a question as a member of the audience. Certainly, go right ahead. As an abutter, just again, recognizing that uh, Carol's not here as a board member. Of course. So, um, Mr. Belanger, the, the stretch between the lane that comes in off Pennacook Street and Pennacook Street per se, is the plan to access, is the plan to access that whole stretch from Pennacook Street so you would come in over Hoyt Brook and then keep going west? Or would you be utilizing the lane with heavy equipment to get in there? Um, just to make sure that I understand. Um, so we're talking about Pentecook Street, um, which is on the east side. So there's a corridor that runs north along Pentecook Street, and then it goes northwest up towards McCoy, where it would cross over Hoytburg. That's the Correct. area you're talking about? Yes. So, yeah, we would utilize um, the existing uh, utility corridor all through that. So we would start the to place the timber matting um, just prior to Hoytburg. Now, where there is a stream crossing involved with Hoytburg, there's just a different configuration of how the matting is placed on top of each other to span the existing brook. Right, but there's also quite a bit of wetland west of Hoyt Brook. You are very much correct. Almost uh, the, there's a number of wetlands um, pockets through the whole utility corridor, which is right. why you'd be using the matting to be placed down. So the access is going to continue from Pentecook Street all the way up the utility corridor. Um, and we've minimized the areas that we're putting the matting within the wetlands, which is why on the individual sheets, um, the access route kind of jogs around and that's to, to so, cross any crossings that we have. We've tried to make sure there's the narrowest portion of any wetlands. Ah. Is there a yeah. pole between, let's look here. So, Does this show the lane? That's where I'm having a little trouble. So Pentecook Street is shown at the top. So north is to the upper left corner. Um, you can see the 75 foot shoreline protection buffer. Um, and Hoyt Brook is running from the top of the page and meanders and then comes down. So where you see uh, wetland impact area number 10, that's really where the crossing will be a point brook. Right. I'm I'm confident that you can safely cross Hoyt Brook with matting without causing any damage to anything. My mm -hmm. question nice. regards the wetland vegetation between Hoyt Brook and high ground, which is quite a distance to the west. Yes, so it's mostly button bush in there, and there's, I mean, there, <clears throat> just to be clear, um, I'm the landowner for a good stretch of that property. Um, there's already been some basically removal of, of wetland shrubs um, 
from the surveying work that was that was done. And I'm just trying to understand, will there be heavy equipment or even matting kind of destroying more of the wetland vegetation or are you sort of snaking around um, between, I mean, trying to hit the areas of open water, I guess. Uh, we are yeah. we are doing our best to avoid um, any areas that are wetland impacts. What we have on the screen right now is a, a pretty good example. So if you can see wetland impact area eight, you'll see there's wetlands on both the top of the corridor and the bottom of the corridor. So what we've done is shown our access route through the middle of that, which is why it snakes around. So we've tried to minimize any sort of, well, I mean, we tried to minimize being within the wetlands to the greatest extent possible. Um, and the another thing to add is as part of this work, TF Moran um, will be hired or is hired as um, compliance monitors. So we've already provided the before pictures which show the condition of the corridor now. Um, one of TFM's representatives will be out there just keeping an eye on everything, ensuring that the vegetation, you know, while it may be trimmed down as part of a maintenance, it's not gonna be removed. The roots and the bases will stay intact. The matting is placed on top of the vegetation. And as we've seen, We've done a number of these projects in the past couple of years. Um, you know, within one growing cycle, that vegetation comes back very nicely. We make sure that if there's any sort of um, disturbance, so around the base of the poles where we've done the installed utility poles themselves, um, hay mulch goes down on top of it. And this is going to be really similar to the project that we presented. Um, before the board last year, which was the 374 line, which ran from Gulf Street to Bridge Street. I don't know if you had a chance to, to look at that, but it, it, it'd be the same methodology behind that and um, utilizing the, um, the New Hampshire Department of Natural and Cultural Resources as a, a best management practice manual for utility maintenance in an adjacent to wetlands. So those are, the practices that we will be following. Which end would you be starting from? That's a good question. Um, I wonder if Nate Sherwood is on the line. Um, I don't know if Nate has an answer to that question. I'm allowing. Um, You're, you should be allowed to speak now, Nate. If you could just uh, state your name for the record, Mr. Sherwood. We can't. We can't hear you. But according to the screen, you are not muted. <laughs> Maybe you need to adjust your speaker somehow. Well, we'll hold that. Uh, we'll hold that question and figure out if they're going to start from the east or start from the west. If we could get an answer, well, back. I mean, I'm, I, I'm just hoping that it would be possible to um, avoid the area of wetland shrubbery immediately west of Pennacook Street to get that in before mid-May. I will uh, send Nate a message that that is what the others would be looking for. And uh, we'll see if we can accommodate that. I'm not sure what side they're, they're starting on. Thanks. I don't want to speak to them. Here, Thank you back. very much. I think, I think we got, uh, Nathan, I think we got you. If you try to speak again. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, you're there now. Okay. Hi, this is Nathan Sherwood. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so in terms of where we would start, um, it's it, they kind of have to work it from both ends, so it's not really a matter of starting at one end or the other. Um, we could we could have them try to do 
the poles in those sensitive areas first, but the matting would still be there until they're finished building the line. Uh, but, you know, depending on how the timing goes, we, we could be finished with the line before mid-May. That would be excellent. Thank you. You're Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sherwood. Thank you, Carol, for your testimony. Any other member of the audience have any questions or concerns regarding this application? Board members or staff, any more comments or concerns? <coughs> I will take that as a no. Uh, so we will move on to our uh, uh, approval process here. So we'll get to item 3.1. Uh, in our packet, which is to grant the following conditional use permit approvals in the existing utility right-of-way line 27 located between McCoy Streets and Village Streets in Penacook, subject to the precedent conditions below, uh, outlined as a CUP uh, in accordance with 2843D and uh, CUP in accordance with Article 283-3F. Uh, precedent conditions 1, 2, any more? And precedent conditions one and two. Would someone like to make a motion to grant? Did I miss anything, Heather? Here is this the only just these these two CUPs? That's right, right. And Beth is saying yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so would someone like to make a motion to grant those uh, conditional use permits as outlined? I'll move. Second. Second. Motion was made by uh, Matt Hicks, uh, seconded by Councilor Pierce. All those in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodfin. Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Member Rosenberg? Aye. Councilor Pierce? Aye. Member Smithmeyer? Aye. <laughs> okay. Uh, that motion passes. We will move. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, the testimony, and uh, we'll recognize Carol Foss back in as a uh, as a member of the board and vice chair, uh, we'll move on to item 7C in our agenda. Can we read that into the record? Downs Racklin Martin, apologize if I said that wrong, wrong. Uh, PLLC on behalf of AT&T requests conditional use permit approval for the installation of telecommunications equipment on top of a building at 29 Hazen Drive in the IS district. Um, staff does recommend the application be determined complete, not a development of regional impact uh, and to open the public hearing. Okay, so we have a determination of completeness component. It has been determined that it is not a development of regional impact, and we will open the public hearing. Someone like to make a motion to uh, determine the application complete and open the public hearing. Uh -oh. Motion was made by Council Pierce. Second. We have a seconded by who was that? Suzanne. Suzanne. Uh, all those in favor by roll call? Chairman Whitfin? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Uh, Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Councilor Pierce? Aye. Uh, Member Rosenberger? Teresa you're on Teresa. mute, Teresa, if you're there. Oh, I'm sorry, aye. Uh, Member Foss? Aye. Member Smithmeyer. Aye. Okay, so open the public hearing. Uh, if the applicant could make themselves known to the host, we'll uh, let them uh, let them speak in just a moment. Uh, if we could get a quick uh, staff update on this uh, on this application. Sure. Um, so this is a, a set of three antenna arrays uh, proposed to be erected on top of the uh, public health laboratory at 29 Hazen Drive. Uh, the top of the building is approximately 52 feet above ground level, and these antenna will not extend beyond uh, 62 feet, so they're only about 10 feet tall. Um, and the applicant has provided uh, ample information in terms of radio frequency emissions, and these are well below uh, the thresholds uh, established by the FCC. Um, the applicant has also provided additional uh, information relative to FAA requirements. Um, I will let them speak to that detail. Um, but aside from that, the application is uh, complete. Great. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we have an attendee here. If you could uh, state your name for the record, please. 
Yes, Mr. Chair, my name is Will Dodge. I'm an attorney at Downs Rackham Martin. I prepared the application. Um, and uh, my colleagues, uh, Peter Marchant, who's with SAI, is also here, as well as Sohail Usmani, who is a radio frequency engineer with C Squared Systems and prepared uh, the radio frequency report that's found as uh, document number six in what we submitted. Great. Tell us a little bit about the project and what uh, any issues we've got with it. Are there any issues that staff has uh, brought up? Um, I would be happy to. Is there a way that I can share my screen or is that, do we not have that? Uh, yes, there is. I can um, promote you to a panelist and just so in a moment you will be able to share your screen. You should feel privileged to be pr promoted to a panelist. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very privileged and will not abuse uh, that. Uh, <laughs> All right. Help. You can you can share now. Okay, so you should be able to share right now. And can you all can you all see that the, the just that cover that says general description of the facility? No, not yet. Oh, You're not sharing not yet. yet. Sorry. There you go. There you go. Okay, very good. So um, this particular project for AT and T is part of what's called the FirstNet build. I won't spend a lot of time on that unless the board has questions about it. Suffice it to say that FirstNet is. Um, a, pro, a, a federal agency that was designed to meet some of the uh, issues that the 9-11 uh, Commission identified concerning interoperability and connection of first responders. Um, it's a nationwide uh, build out of capabilities for first responders. Uh, AT&T won that bid and is basically extending uh, its network and making it coextensive with FirstNet. So there were several sites all around New Hampshire that were selected as being places where first responders wanted better service and the Concord facility uh, is one of those locations. So you can see basically this is the, um, this is a state of New Hampshire lot that has multiple government buildings on it, including the, um, including the public health laboratory, which is the building that we're going to be going on. Um, you can see with the profile, um, as uh, Mr. Durfee said, top of the roof presently, is um, just a little bit over 51 feet, and the antennas are going to extend uh, in three places on what are called sled mounts, ultimately to a height of 63 feet. The reason that they're not exactly 10 feet, which would have um, obviated the need for us to seek a conditional use permit from you, is because of the heights of some of the parapets around the roof and the requirements of the antennas. We couldn't build them basically any shorter than they are. Uh, in addition to the antennas, there's what's called a walk-in cabinet or a wick that basically is gonna be flush against the building on the ground. And there are cable trays going up the side of the building and up the, um, up the penthouse that are going to be painted to match uh, the sides going up. So to try to uh, reduce its impact. Um, you can see here where those uh, sled mounts are located on the roof, one is kind of on one side of the building and the other two are basically up near where the stairwell is located. Um, even though, as, as Mr. Durfee explained, the RF emissions are well below the FCC's threshold, we'll still have all the safety signage uh, on, the, uh, on the interior doors leading out to the roof so that people know, don't go near the antennas if you don't know what you're doing. But even for occupational and general, um, it's, it's safe. So that's really just fulfilling an FCC requirement. It's always easiest to show this is the existing profile. Here it is with the simulations. You can see that they're not uh, particularly conspicuous. And depending on the angle you look at, don't look uh, all that much taller than the chillers. Here's another angle where you can certainly see them a little more prominently, but they're not uh, wholly out of place given all of the appurtenances and uh, um, and utility infrastructure that are on those rooftops to begin with. Um, the real reason for this, for this particular project, you can see here, these are all the existing AT&T cell sites in the area. And the idea for this particular um, site, which is shown here as NH2200, where the cursor is located, uh, is to offload traffic from all these sites. So what happens is um, when even though there's existing coverage, like you can use your phone when you go to this to this general area of, of government buildings, as well as areas of, of 393 and to some degree New Hampshire Route 4, 
The problem is, is that you will see that you have coverage, but you'll end up dropping a call because there's too many people all using their devices at one time. So this is what we often call a capacity site. And what will happen once we have the site is that this area will get filled in um, pretty nicely in terms of not having that um, offloading all of those traffic from multiple sites. So uh, in addition to covering a lot of roads, we estimate that it will improve service for roughly 650 residents in the area and about 390 employees who, who work either in government buildings or other uh, commercial buildings. And what that amounts to in terms of an offload area is roughly two miles or a two mile square uh, uh, area that ends up getting served. In the response to the staff report, uh, there were a couple. There are a couple of items in particular. One was a concern about uh, correspondence between the applicant and the FAA regarding their review of the project. Um, the the actual the the key feature of the project that required interaction with the FAA are the crane or the crane and the crane extension that will be used uh, to mount the antennas on the building. And as you can see here, and as we've separately provided to Mr. Durfee. We have sign off from that. There's not going to be um, any need for uh, lighting of the crane and, uh, and the crane is otherwise authorized to use. And then in terms of this, the second comment, there was a question about um, uh, that for the antenna installation, it would require uh, coordination with the FAA through form FAA 7460-1. We, want, um, we were asked to provide a copy of the FAA permit associated with this form or written confirmation from the FAA indicating the permit is not necessary. The form itself indicates that any antenna structure of 20 feet or less in height, um, other than one that would increase the height of another antenna structure is actually exempt from this requirement. So um, that's something that we confirmed with our FAA consultant. So really it's just the crane uh, activity that required FAA approval. Um, the staff also asked for certain notes to be added to the construction drawings, and we've since uh, done that, and we have a new set of site plans uh, submitted to Mr. Durfee. So okay. I I've used my privilege, so I'll, I'll turn that off for now. And we will demote you properly back to a not, par not panelist. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, uh, for that testimony and for the, uh, for the visuals. The visuals do help. Uh, any member of the board have a question or comment or concern regarding this application? Uh, Heather, any member of the audience, or if there's any member of the audience, please make yourself known to the uh, to the chair, and we'll uh, we'll hear your uh, your comments. If not, I don't see anybody. Heather, do you? No. So we will close the public hearing, and uh, um, we will look to our report here. There. So in our report, we have uh, the 2.1 in your, sorry, it's hiding down at the bottom of page one. So uh, recommendation is to grant the CUP approval for the installation of telecommunications equipment at 29 Hazen Drive, uh, subject to the precedent conditions outlined in one, two, three, and four, and subsequent conditions one and two. Would someone like to make a motion uh, to grant that conditional use permit as uh, so eloquently uh, read into the record there. Could I interrupt just for a moment, Certainly, please, Rich? Yeah. I just want to confirm um, determination and completeness motion. Yes, we did that. And, uh, okay. and a, I did not. Not, not a development that. of, yet. Yeah, not a development of regional impact. Didn't we? Did we do that? Yeah, we did. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. I'm sorry. Now you got me questioning it. Yeah, I think, yes, we did. I think we did because yeah. I made the recommendation. Yeah, yeah, you did. Okay. So we did. Does anybody remember who made the motion? If Lisa didn't catch it, that means it's not in the record. I can go back and check the recording. I'm sorry okay. to interrupt. Okay. I just wanted okay. to double check. Um, yep. So uh, if we would take a motion on 2.1 to grant the conditional use permit as outlined with the precedent and subsequent conditions. Move approval. Second. Motion is uh, made by Councilor Pierce, seconded by David Fox. Uh, all those in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Member Rosenberger? Aye. Vice Chair Foss? Aye. Councilor Pierce? Aye. Member Smithmeyer? Aye. 
Okay, that moves us on. That passes. Thank you very much for the uh, the presentation, gentlemen. Uh, have a good evening, and we will move on to item 7D. If we could read item 7D into the record. Uh, Joe Weikert, on behalf of Sally Stoughton Hatch, request minor subdivision approval for a three lot subdivision at 233 Hopkinton Road in the open space residential district. Staff does recommend the application be determined complete, not a development of regional impact, and to open the public hearing. Okay, so we have a determination of completeness component. There is uh, no development of regional impact, uh, and there is going to be a public hearing tonight. Would someone like to make a motion to find the application complete and open the public hearing? So moved. So moved. Second. The motion uh, was made by uh, David Fox and seconded by John Regan. All those in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Member Rosenberger? Aye. Vice Chair Foss? Aye. Councillor Pierce? Aye. Member Smith Meyer? Aye. Okay, so we will open the public hearing. I welcome the applicant to the table if they would like to uh, make themselves known. Uh, to the host, we will uh, elevate you up and allow you to speak. And would we get a quick staff update on this application? Sure, and I will share my screen uh, to aid in the update. Um, so as was stated, this is a three lot minor subdivision off of Hawkington Road, um, just uh, to the west of Little Turkey Pond. Um, there's been uh, quite a bit of discussion and there's also two waivers uh, relative to the usable area. Uh, typically you would see a usable area rectangle uh, with a configuration similar to this. However, due to site constraints uh, such as um, the uh, shoreline setbacks, um, wet areas uh, around Ash Brook, um, the usable area is more uh, trapezoidal in shape. Um, the applicant is requesting two waivers uh, for size and configuration. Um, so that would be the shape of it, as well as uh, this woodland buffer line. Uh, this is 150 feet off of the reference line of Little Turkey Pond, uh, which our regs say that it cannot be included in usable area, but can be built on compliant with uh, DES regulations. So those are two waivers uh, for usable area right there. Um, and in addition, there's a third waiver, um, which en engineering had brought to our attention. Um, anytime a uh, water course runs through a subdivision, um, our regs state that a uh, conservation easement or drainage easement granted to the city would be needed. Um, and we have also received a waiver request for that as well. Uh, and with that, I will stop my share and I will turn it over to Joe. Okay, if you could just state your name for the record, sir. Sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm Joe Wickert, and I'm here tonight on behalf of uh, Sally Hatch and the Sally Stoughton Hatch uh, Revocable Trust of 2009. So, um, Sam, had, um, Sam had, had kind of covered the, uh, the highlights of it, and so Ms. Hatch owns, uh, it's lot 13 on block three of tax map 98. It's located on the south side of uh, Hopkinton Road, which is also known as uh, U.S. Route 202 and 9. Uh, currently, the Hatch residence, which is 233 Hopkinton Road, is, is located at the very west end of that property. Uh, there's an old farmhouse and a barn there. And um, the property is configured, has uh, currently has 7.16 acres of property and has approximately 1,137 feet of frontage on Hopkinton Road. So the proposal is to create two building lots east of the existing house. Um, there are two wetlands. If you look at the plan on the, um, if you if you look at the plan, there were uh, two wetlands on the property. One sits between the house and what's uh, shown as new lot one. And then uh, there is an ash brook runs through the second wet uh, second wetlands, and that's more or less between the boundary of new lot one and two. Um, then lot 13 reconfigured and new lot one uh, fully comply with the uh, local regulations. On new lot two, when we submitted it, we felt we needed a waiver for uh, the usable area box configuration uh, rather than having a rectangle with the um, minimum 60 foot side. Uh, we had sort of a trapezoid with a, I think it's a 48 foot. Uh, or 46 foot side. 
And uh, during the review process, we uh, there were two items that came up. One is that we cannot, we couldn't count uh, what's shown on our plan is on the southeast corner of the usable area box for um, new lot two, that little pie shaped piece that's, uh, that's approximately 820 square feet. That area is uh, within 150 feet of the reference line of Little Turkey Pond. So it's subject to the woodland buffer requirements of New Hampshire DES. But uh, you can build a house in that in that area uh, in that in that section of property. Uh, so we felt that it, it could be counted, but the staff had advised that that uh, historically has not been allowed to be counted. And then, as Sam mentioned, when we got the staff report back, um, engineering had had brought it to everyone's attention that typically, um, if there's a waterway that runs through it with drainage, that uh, the uh, an easement is required um, from the uh, to the city, but is uh, Hopkins Road is state controlled. Uh, there is no uh, city system in here, so uh, engineering had supported a waiver to not require uh, the easement. So we added that to our waiver request. Um, the existing house is serviced by on-site well and septic. The two new, two new lots will be. I was hopeful that we were going to have the DS uh, subdivision approval today, but that did not come through, but that should be shortly. And we are currently working with uh, DOT on the two driveway curb cuts on the property. Uh, so having said that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, any questions from the board regarding this application? I can't see everybody, Sam. If you can uh, just unshare for a sec, I just want to see if anybody's waving their hand wildly. No. Any uh, member of the audience have any questions or concerns regarding this application, if you could make yourself known. So uh, I don't know who wants to speak to it, Sam, or, or whoever can speak to it, but when you're waiting on DES approval and you're waiting on curb cut approval, uh, do we have to do anything regarding, uh, you know, any types of notice or anything that we need to put into the approval process or? Oh, those can be conditions of approval. So are they conditions of approval? In the report, I don't believe so, but they would be needed uh, for the lots to be viable. So um, effectively they, they need to be done so we don't need to add them to our on our end. They're, they'll be part of Correct. the process to get it through the, the the system. Okay. And these are not the other the west. You said the um, Mr. Weicker. You said the existing lot is not serviced by Concord Water or sewer, right? It's a private sewer. Right. Okay. Uh, private sewer uh, on site septic on site well, sir. On site, yeah. Sorry, I meant that instead of private. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, Rich, I did miss. I must misspoke. Those are actually conditions of approval. They are in the engineering report. They are okay. Thank you, uh, Carol. You have your hand up. I do. Um, sorry, I was looking on Google Earth. It took me a while to get back. Um, does the oh, did the welcome, conservation welcome commission? Back, pardon. Welcome back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, did the conservation commission look at this? at all? Uh, no. Yeah, we have not met with them. And it, since once the subdivision goes through, um, we have no say about building on those sites, right? So I'm just a little concerned about the stream and the extent of wetlands there and the fact that it would be, um, everything would be on septic. Um, would they be required to come for a conditional use permit if there was any impacts to those buffers? So that would be the check. That was when conservation that would be commission. The okay. So they're not asking for anything that's going to incur into the buffer other than the buildable buildable space on the woodland buffer, right? Yeah, sure. they they comply. They've shown compliance with everything that needs to be outside of those buffers. So if they happen to encroach in the buffers, that would be a violation um, that hopefully staff would catch if it if it occurred. Um, but my understanding is they they understand that they're not allowed to encroach in the wetland buffers. Um, and the, the woodland buffer, they're allowed to build 
um, they're allowed to disturb up to 50% of the woodland buffer. So while we're in support of the waiver to not include it, uh, because we think that they're demonstrating that they have sufficient space without it, um, you know, they they are from a regulatory perspective, you know, allowed to impact up to 50% of that buffer. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? This is Jeff Santa Cruz. I just want to clarify, sir, Sam, the conditional approval of the driveway permit is before the subdivision is completely approved so that it does not put the onus on DOT then to issue permits that may have issues with their sight lines or other conditions? It, it's a precedent condition, so it would be before we sign off on the building permit. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? So let's look at the uh, approval aspect we've got in our packet here. You want to uh, close the public hearing? Yes, we'll close the public hearing and thank you for your testimony. Um, Mr. Weikert, uh, we thank will you. move to the approval process here. We've got in our packet grant, uh, grant the waivers of section 19054 of the subdivision regulations under 4.1. And grant the mine. Oh, yeah, we've oh. got to do that one separately, right? Rich, we do need to add uh, a waiver to section 2311 uh, for the drainage easement. As uh, as the waiver piece. Yes. So can you um, can you give us some language that we will add to 4.1? So as 4.1 sits now with uh, granting uh, the waiver for section 19054 for the subdivision regulations. I think that's the only one for that waiver, right? Is that just yeah, so you, you can say uh, 1905 uh, subsection four, uh, as well as uh, section 2311. And 2311 is for? That's for the uh, drainage easement. 2311 for the drainage easement. So someone like to make a motion to grant those two waivers as outlined. Don't make me say it again if I can help it. I'll move approval. Second. Second. John Regan uh, made that motion and it was seconded, I think, by Suzanne or David. Uh, all those in favor by roll call? Wait, let's clarify. Su Suzanne. Suzanne. Suzanne made it. Okay. I heard uh, both. Chairman, <laughs> Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Uh, Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Member Rosenberger? Aye. Vice Chair Foss? Aye. Councilor Pierce? Aye. Member Smith Meyer? Aye. That's it. Okay, and then uh, so that motion passes. And then 4.2 is to grant the minor subdivision approval for the three lot subdivision at 233 Hopkinton Road with the following conditions, which are outlined in conditions one through nine. Would someone like to make a motion to grant that minor subdivision approval? Loved. Oops, hold on a sec. We'll, uh, before we take that motion, uh, Carol, you had a question? I just have a question. Um, the applicant mentioned that they were still waiting on an approval from something in the state, which they were hoping to get today, but didn't. I'm just from, wondering from if DES. we need to add that as a condition. No, we I do not. That's, that's what I asked before. I was oh, asking sorry. that before. Yep, no, that's fine. And then same with the driveways, that was the same. I asked them in the same question, so. Okay, okay. Uh, good on that question-wise. So we'll move on to our, uh, the motion again was to grant minor subdivision approval with the uh, following conditions outlined in one through nine. Would someone like to make a motion to grant that minor subdivision approval as outlined? I'll move uh, that. Uh, motion's been made by Councilor Pierce. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Suzanne. Uh, all those in favor by roll call? Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Member Roseberger? Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Foss? Aye. Councilor Pierce? Aye. Member Smith Meyer? Aye. Okay, so that motion carries and uh, that approval has been done. Uh, good luck with the subdivision approval or the subdivision process. And uh, we'll hope to see you back here with some building uh, 
some buildings in the future. Let's uh, let's move on to our next item on our agenda, which is 7E. John Rokey, on behalf of Whitmore Holdings, requests major site plan approval for the expansion of a vehicular storage area, the construction of a new storage yard, and a second driveway at 45 Chanel Drive in the IN Industrial District. This application was um, previously determined complete uh, and staff recommends opening the public hearing. Okay, uh, we've heard this, we've, this has been before us before, right? Correct. Okay, so we'll open the public hearing. If the applicant's here, if you could make yourself known to the, uh, to the uh, host, we will uh, let you speak and uh, get a quick staff update on this. If this is uh, something we could get a staff update from. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you need a motion to open the public hearing, I'll make that. No, we don't. We're no, good we don't. It. No. Okay. So Sam, give us a quick update. So uh, you are you are right, Rich. This has been here before us uh, before. Uh, this area right here is a storage yard that I believe is currently used uh, as an impound lot for the city police department. Uh, so this is what is currently on the ground today. Um, what is being proposed is an expansion of this storage yard uh, to this size uh, for the expanded infiltration pond. Uh, the second driveway is over here, um, and this is to access a storage yard uh, in this area uh, with an expanded infiltration pond there. Uh, there is a waiver request, uh, which is to not tie into the city drainage system um, for an emergency overflow for many of these uh, infiltration ponds. Um, I believe engineering does not support this waiver request. Uh, planning is deferring to engineering for this, uh, but uh, I believe the applicant will will make his case. Okay, uh, and Sam, just because I know everybody's looking at that plan and thinking, yes, we've seen that before. What was this on our agenda last month, and what was the reason it's back again? I, I can't recall off the top of my head. I think there was something to do with that space up in the top corner and a, yes. curb, a curb uh, cut as well. The the driveway um, for for any driveway uh, it is required to be 24 feet uh, unless a conditional use permit is applied for. Um, but it was listed at 20. This has since been revised to 24. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, welcome the applicant to the table if they would like to make their case uh, um, and tell us uh, what we need to know regarding this application. That would be great. Or not? Oh, there you are. Uh I promoted uh, you to panelist, John, but you're you're muted, and I cannot unmute you. You you have to do it. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, good evening, John Rokey with Rokey Consulting. Uh, yes, we're here this evening uh, to basically go through the go through the revisions to the plan that we had made. Uh, like we had said, at, like Sam had said at the last meeting, the driveway that we had up in up in front. Uh, was at listed at 20 feet. Uh, instead of applying for a conditional use permit, we just uh, widened the road to 24, so that eliminated the issue with that. Um, we had a couple engineering issues with the detention pond in the rear that we had uh, several Zoom meetings with uh, engineering staff uh, since the last meeting. And I believe we have everything worked out with them at this point. We basically upsized the pond to hold the entire 100 year event. Uh, without overtopping to the emergency overflow at all, even even during a frozen event. So uh, we basically we we made some significant revisions to the pond to and work with engineering on that. Uh, the waiver that we're asking for is has doesn't have anything to do with the rear pond or the storage yard. Um, it's for the existing pond up in front, uh, right by Chanel Drive which is a pond that has existed since uh, 19, 1985 when the, when the place was built. Uh, there was, there's never been a connection into the municipal system and to connect into it at this point, you'd have to basically cut into the road and, and uh, do some work in Chanel Drive to hook up an existing detention pond that's been there since 1985. Um, that's that's the one we're asking for a waiver for. It's it we're complying with everything, every, all the uh, new structures, uh, and new detention ponds that we're that we're putting in in the rear. Uh, so that's that's basically where we're at. Um, I think all we had gone through everything at the last meeting, and um, that was what we had did. That's what we've uh, worked on since the last meeting. 
So is the detention pond issue becoming a, an issue because of the the new driveway that's going in? Is that uh, in no? It's, it has nothing to. It's nothing to do with that one. That one is actually the one near that driveway is actually connected in already. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's the one. If Sam, if you can bring it up on your screen, I can uh, kind of explain it and, and show where it is. It's the one down uh, down on the uh, western. I guess it's the easterly corner. Uh, the huge area down in that down in that corner right there. Okay. That's the area that uh, that we are asking for the waiver to get, to connect into. So if if I look at these plans just as a layman here, and I'm looking at the existing parking lot that's in the building, uh, yep. that that runoff is all handled by that pond there, right? Correct. Yep. And then and the new has... the new expanded space in the back of the building is going to be handled by the the larger yep. pond that you've the rear uh, pond done there, yep. and then the up in the upper new corner where the new impervious surface is done, that pond is to scale and and is uh, is appropriately sized. Correct. Okay. Great. Uh, any other questions from the board regarding this application? I do want to hear from engineering. So, uh, David or Gary, if you can uh, weigh in on this, that would be great. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Ken, thank you. All right. Good. Uh, yeah. So, uh, again, uh, John has worked with us uh, since the last meeting, and we've gone through um, all of the issues, and we've resolved everything at this point. Uh, the only the only sticking point is just that discussion of the waiver, uh, tying, again, that drainage pond at the bottom of the screen uh, into the municipal system. Um, our, our stance on that is just that, uh, you know, it's in the site plan regulations for a good reason. Um, best engineering practice, you always want to have some sort of emergency overflow. Um, uh, if you take a look at that new pond that's going at the, at the top of the site, uh, it certainly is sized to handle the 100-year flood, even during a, a frozen event. Um, our, our experience is over time and over, um, you know, as rainfall has, uh, patterns have changed over the years and you get more storm, uh, you know, more frequent storm events, larger storm events, it's always a smart idea to have your system tied into or having some sort of an emergency overflow. Um, if you look at that pond on the far right of the screen, that emergency overflow ultimately does flow to the pond uh, pond one at the bottom of the screen. And so while the, uh, the uh, occurrence of that is certainly going to be pretty rare, our thought is uh, just general engineering practice. You should always be having some sort of an overflow or an emergency uh, in case of situation. And so by not being tied into the municipal system, um, this pond would likely flood out a, a you know, if you were to ever get there, flood out a significant portion of the uh, parking lot. So that's really the only sticking point we have at this point, uh, but wanted to uh, leave it up to, uh, that's just our take on uh, yep. on the whole uh, situation. So, uh, Dave can step in if I have uh, missed anything, but that was our stance. Okay. Uh, Dave, anything to add? Or are you good? Well, I'm in agreement with uh, with what Gary said. You know, we do have um, issues through the city, uh, particularly during the winter. Infiltration doesn't happen uh, during times um, in, uh, in the late winter. And that is also times when we get some really intense rainfall. So uh, it's, uh, it's always a good idea to have an emergency overflow uh, and a place for that water to go. Okay. And, and no concerns that it's been there for 30, 30 plus years I mean, no, 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 that doesn't change your mind at that point. It's just good practice to do it. And that's the, that's the reasoning, right? That's right. Okay. Great. Any questions of engineering from the board? Uh, yeah, I, I do have a question. So when you said that if this pond were to overflow, it flows into the parking lot. If it overflowed without that emergency, could it flow and potentially flat out in a butter? Um, eventually it would, if it were to go anywhere, it would eventually go over. If you see that 338 contour at the bottom of the screen, um, mm -hmm. well, anyway, yeah, I know that's not shared on there, but, um, basically if it were to eventually get high enough, it would flood out their parking lot before it would flood out the neighbor. Um, uh, but if it were to eventually go somewhere, it would be going into the neighbor's, uh, neighbor's pond, which, um, uh, does appear to be tied into the system, but they don't, there's no drainage easement to that property. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, that, that, so drainage easement. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you guys for the testimony. Uh, John, any uh, comments or follow-up? Uh, 
it's actually oh, I'm, my, my only my only point is that it's been there for almost 40 years and I don't think this has ever happened in the past in the pond that we're putting in in the rear uh, is actually sized to it sized and graded in a way that it actually takes drainage away from the front pond. Um, if the emergency overflow, I mean, in the, in the event of a 500 year event or something like that, and any water came out of the rear pond, it would have to flow down through a drainage swale down to the front pond that we're talking about uh, on Chanel Drive. And um, I, I, I guess it, our only argument is that it's been there for 40 years and there's never been a single issue with it that we're aware of. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so any other questions, comments, concerns from members of the audience or staff? Seeing none, we'll uh, close public hearing. Thank you, Gary and David, for your testimony. Uh, John, thank you for your testimony. So before us, we've got the um, uh, we've got the waiver application. Would any of the member of the board like to discuss that? Uh, is there a strong objection one way or the other, whether we approve, disapprove, deny the waiver? I'd love to hear comments or questions, if you got any. Okay, speaks volume. So let's uh, let's look at it. I will uh, tell you that I'm not in favor. I, I'm I'm in favor of granting the waiver. I hate to I hate to do it against engineering, but I I I hear what the applicant's saying, and I think it's putting a little bit of a burden on him to do the uh, to do that. But let's uh, let's see where we go. So let's. Um, uh, under 2.1, uh, which is to grant the waiver, the application requests a waiver from 2203, the site plan regulations, uh, to not tie into the municipal system, uh, planning the first engineering on whether to support this or not. And again, I, I'd like to address it as a single item on our uh, agenda here, and I will make a motion to grant that waiver as outlined. Um, if someone would like to second that, if not, we'll let it die on the vine. Second, Rick. Uh, we got a second by Matt Hicks. Uh, so we'll go through the roll call vote. All those in favor? Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Nay. Member Fox? Aye. Vice Chair Foss? Aye. Uh, Councilor Pierce? Aye. Member Rosenberger? Aye. Member Smithmeyer. Aye. Okay, so with one abstain, with one uh, dissension, that motion does pass uh, to grant that waiver as outlined. Uh, so we'll move on to technical review comments. Uh, has everything, uh, Sam, been uh, addressed in the technical review comments regarding the application? Uh, we we still need some uh, changes to the landscaping plan, um, but those are wrapped up in conditions of approval. Okay, so we'll address those in conditions of approval. So it moves us to item 5.1. Uh, 5.1 is to grant architectural design approval <coughs> for the site layout. Um, Heather, I'm taking, we're going to address this one as one, and then the site plan is a second uh, motion and approval. Correct. Okay, so we've got 5.1 is to grant ADR approval for the site layout. Would someone like to make a motion to grant ADR approval? So moved. Second. Motion is made by John Regan, seconded by Matt Hicks. All those in favor by roll call? Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Vice Chair Foss? Aye. Councilor Pierce? Aye. Member Rosenberger? Aye. Member smith -Meyer. Aye. Okay, at 5.2 is to grant the major site plan approval for the proposed expansion to an existing storage yard, uh, construction of new storage yard and construction of a new driveway at 45 Chanel Drive, subject to the following precedent conditions, uh, one through four, and subsequent conditions one, two, and three. Would someone like to make a motion to grant major site plan approval as outlined? So moved. Motion is made by David Fox and seconded by Councilor Pierce. Uh, all those in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodfin? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. Member Santa Cruz? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Vice Chair Foss? Aye. 
Member Rosenberger? Aye. Member Smith Meyer? Aye. Okay, that motion carries. That is all set. Thank you very much for um, everyone's uh, participation in that. And uh, we'll move on to our next item, which is 7F on our agenda. If we could read that into the record. TF Moran, on behalf of Bradley, Whitney, uh, Jennifer Habel, and Interchange Development, requesting major site plan approval and an amendment to a comprehensive development plan for a three phase development consisting of a grocery store, liquor store, medical offices, financial services, retail stores, restaurants, and industrial uses. Also requested is a conditional use permit to allow a driveway closer than is otherwise permitted for property off of Whitney Road in the Gateway Performance District. This application was previously determined complete, also determined a development of original, of <laughs> development of regional impact, um, and staff uh, does recommend the public hearing be open. Okay, great. So we will open the public hearing. We'll welcome everybody to the table that's going to be coming in uh, uh, as panelists or as uh, speaking people in the uh, in the presentation portion. I do want to uh, request that any member of the audience that uh, that does wish to speak when you're uh, when you're opened up and your mic is opened, if you can state your name uh, and your address. So if you are a Concord resident or if you are a resident of Canterbury or Bosquin or one of the surrounding areas, uh, we just like to know that. So uh, with that, let's open it up and uh, and welcome uh, the folks uh, from Interchange Development and the uh, associated companies that are represented here. And uh, if you could. Uh, Hang on just a sec. We're going to get a staff update, and we'll get you all squared away and uh, and in queue, ready to go. So, uh, if we could get a staff update, uh, please. Sure. Um, so, I'm sure the applicant will give a, a thorough presentation to you all, but I just want to bring up some points for the board to be aware of. Um, this there is some um, partnership with the city on this project for the offsite improvements. And the city is still working on a development agreement with um, the developer. So some of the comments of uh, conditions of approval are dependent on that development agreement negotiations. So um, there's some items that are still being worked on. So I just want to make you aware of that. Um, the right of way is still being determined where that's going to be located. So we have comments about that. Um, those will be addressed through the development agreement and future negotiations. Um, still, VHB is working on the final roundabout designs. I believe January they're looking to have final drawings. So there may be some tweaks, um, but those may be developing a little bit further beyond what is shown on the drawings you see tonight. Um, there are some waivers which we are in support of, um, and the conditional use permit, which staff supports. And then there was one item which um, we had not discussed, I spoke with um, Lori Rossio today about it, um, but the sidewalk between the Merchants Way Drive and the um, Interchange Drive is not shown to be complete. They're required to, with, um, within the urban growth boundary to continue that sidewalk all along the property line. It'll be a sidewalk to nowhere until they develop phase two. So, um, we may recommend a waiver that that sidewalk not does not have to be completed until phase two comes in. So that may be something that we have to add on to the record. Um, if you if planning board is amenable to that as part of our conditions of approval towards the end. So just keeping that in the back of your mind. Um, they do have a separate land unit condominium, which is a, a different item on the agenda after this. And that's to um, separate ownership into five land units. So that's all I have and um, can open up to the applicant for their presentation. Great, okay. So let's do that, Heather. I don't know if you've got people popping in here. I see some names on here. If we can uh, welcome you guys to the table and if you could state your names for the record. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Laurie Rossio and I'm here tonight with my husband, David. Uh, we're members of Interchange Development LLC and we are residents of Canterbury. Uh, we have several team members participating in tonight's meeting, including Jason Hill with TF Moran, Jim Lamp and Carmine Tomas uh, representing Market Basket, Andy Davis, Chief Administrator for New Hampshire Liquor Commission, Eric Brown of PCA Architects, and Randy Shane, uh, President of TCD Construction. Uh, before Jason presents the site plan details, we just wanted to express our appreciation for the continued cooperation and coordination of city staff and their consultants to bring this project to the stage. They have been working around the clock to review the on-site improvements 
as well as coordinating with BHB and DOT for the improvements at Hoyt and Whitney Roads. And much of that progress has occurred in 2020 with the challenges of COVID. So we just wanna thank the city staff and thank the board members for allowing us to present this project for your consideration. And if we receive approval this evening and all else goes as planned, we expect to start construction of phase one in April of 2021. So with that, I'd like to ask Jason Hill from TF Moran to present the site plan details. Hey, yeah, Actually, before, before we do that, before we do that, Jason, if anybody else uh, on your team that you listed off is a member of the audience there, if they could just uh, raise their hand yes, or sir. make themselves known to the uh, to the host, we'll uh, cue them up in case we have a question. Um, you don't have to speak. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you can just queue up, that would be great. So uh, with that, uh, uh, Jason, go ahead. Or was it Jason? Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yes. This is Jason. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully you all can see my screen. I just loaded a, basically, the, this is the comprehensive development plan. I trust that everyone can see the plan. Um, yep. And I'm just, you all have a copy of this plan. Um, we reviewed it, a similar plan recently. As Lori said, we're here tonight. Um, <clears throat> as you are aware, this is a, a site plan. Uh, phase one site plan approval for um, the 80,775 80, square foot supermarket with an attached 22,483 square foot retail tenant, as well as a freestanding 13,554 square foot on New Hampshire liquor and wine outlet. The supermarket is here, retail here, liquor and wine outlet here, the remaining um, layout that we're looking at is the comprehensive development plan. So tonight we're seeking approval for phase one, as well as some amendments to the CDP plan, basically related to the uh, phase two uh, areas, <clears throat> as well as the condominium, which Beth has mentioned, uh, just a five unit land condominium um, associated with this development. So uh, I'm going to be brief um, in touch the main details and I want then I'm going to then hand it over for a brief architectural presentation. Um, so so since um, we've met with the board in September for a design review phase at that point where we um, reviewed the similar plan, took comments from the board and um, Basically, the discussion was related to uh, the focus of uh, pedestrian making this development um, geared towards um, optimizing the pedestrian interconnectivity between the sites themselves. Um, that was in September. We've worked with planning staff as well as some of our uh, internal design team to try to realize those objectives. And so we've fine tuned things uh, towards those, those matters. Um, basically looking at providing linear uh, grid-like corridors for, you know, sidewalk, basically the sidewalk network being a, a linear uh, grid-like network, which is easy to follow as well as easily accessible to the individual development, you know, I'll call them pad developments, but this is not a pad development site, uh, but the individual building sites, um, which is the focus that drove the layout and the network that we're presenting in this plan, as well as a focal point in the interior, which is basically a common space, open area, open space uh, element, which uh, lends itself nicely to uh, actively being an amenity to the development um, in this, this would be this, this open space in the central area adjacent to a future restaurant site. Uh, we've done a similar design uh, in Bedford, New Hampshire, which we're looking at now. And this is Market in Maine, which was recently developed on South River Road. Uh, this is a similar design element where we have a restaurant amenity or a restaurant facility with a widened, you know, potential um, outdoor seating element. You have this 
par, uh, open space slash park with seating elements. The, uh, the you, I'm house. sorry, Jason. Are you share? Are you sharing something? We're not seeing anything different than what was on the screen before. Okay, let me try to switch this view to a different share. Okay. Here we go. So well, that this, looks nice. Go back to that. that, that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this uh, a vantage point. This is from the Yelp website for the Friendly Toast web, uh, uh, website, which is located within the central uh, portion of the market and main development, which is recently developed in Bedford. And this is a um, similar design that we're uh, implementing, which is basically an open space area in the central focal point of the development, which can be used for a variety of, you know, passive recreational um, eating opportunities, outdoor seating. It's an attractive uh, and successful uh, uh, land, you know, land planning element that we're looking to utilize for this project. Um, so I just wanted to, I tried to get some real other pictures from Google Earth, but it's too old. There, there's a Trader Joe's on, on this particular project that is here. But this is basically the, what we're, the style we're planning for. Uh, and I wanted to share that as well. So getting back to my brief outline, we've made a significant effort to focus on the pedestrian interconnectivity in this between the individual buildings with basically making them practical and local, you know, and accessible to the individual units. And uh, so you'll, need, you'll need to go back to that other view because we're still seeing the, we're yep. still seeing the Bedford view. And with this grid like pattern where it's easily um, accessible and efficient. Uh, additionally, we have <clears throat> provided a widened the main road networks are a widened road section uh, with widened paved shoulders to provide for bicycle routes through the development. Merchants Way, which is this driveway, the front door of the market basket will have widened paved shoulders to provide for bicycle routes through the development, uh, to <clears throat> allow for bicycle routes through the development. It'll have sidewalks along both sides Provisions have been made to allow for a transit bus stop within the central region of the development. And that would be basically in the proximity of the park or the open space. We have a pullout, which will basically allow for a potential um, <clears throat> transit bus stop within the central region of the development. And um, that kind of compromises uh, comprises the main uh, aspects of our that drive the layout that we're looking at on this plan. Uh, U.S. Route 4, which is Hoyt Road, at Whitney Road, which is this intersection here, as well as this intersection, which is Whitney Road at our main site driveway, will be upgraded with new roundabout intersections to accommodate the development traffic. The traffic study has been accepted by the NHDOT these improvements are currently being designed by the city and its consultants. And the plan is to have these improvements completed uh, hopefully in 2021. Uh, obviously prior to the opening of the supermarket, these uh, intersections will be uh, required to have been completed and operational. Uh, the phasing of the project is, uh, like I said, we're seeking approval of phase one of a three phase CDP the second phase consisting of these interior lands. It's a composition of retail, medical office, a restaurant, uh, fast foods uh, type use end users that we're, we're seeking, as well as the, the industrial land in the back, which we're uh, <clears throat> planning as a, an industrial or a distribution type facility. Those individual site plans are required to come back before the planning board when and if they are uh, developed, and those are subsequent to future review processes. And basically, I'm going to leave you with um, the summary of the changes, the major changes that we've made to the plan since we met with you in September. Uh, primarily, 
the reworking of the phase two areas and the sidewalk uh, networks, which I already mentioned, as well as an, an extension of the sidewalk network from this development to the planned pedestrian uh, facilities, sidewalks, AKA sidewalk network along the improved Whitney Road and the Whitney Road, Hoyt Road uh, roundabout, as well as we didn't talk about it much, but it had been planned that there's an earthen berm that um, is proposed in the area um, highlighting, which is the central area between the supermarket site and the wheel abrader facility. There's enough land uh, area to uh, soften the impacts from of the wheel abrader from our parking lot. So we're proposing to construct an earth and berm vegetated earth and berm of up to 20 to 25 feet in height so that uh, for aesthetic and noise impacts reductions to our uh, supermarket client uh, and users you know basically this is a, a power plant the uh, energy to waste facility wheel abrader you're mo most of you are probably familiar with it it has tall stacks in an industrial like look so in this facility, we will infill this area with an earthen burn to block the visual of that wheel abrader facility, and as well as we'll um, absorb, uh, not that the, the, the facility emanates a ton of noise, but there is a noise associated with it, which will be absorbed in that berm. That's a positive, um, and it was um, discussed with the ADR, who also uh, uh, agreed with the positive nature of that. Uh, we're currently working through some of the technical engineering uh, final uh, level details, construction type level details with the city engineering and planning office. And we're committed to uh, ensuring that all of those uh, aspects are coordinated with, uh, with that, those groups and that we satisfy any and all of their concerns and uh, with that, I will just like to turn it over to Eric Brown of uh, PCA to present to you the architecture. Hello everyone, Eric Brown. Eric, I'm uh, promoting you to panelists so you can share your screen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share it for him, Heather. So, sorry, I meant oh, to- All right, you. well, he's a panelist anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I'm starting with the elevation views of the market basket. We're still seeing the development plan. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to go. Everybody can hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm not able to use my camera tonight and that I have Jason um assisting me but um i'm happy to be here tonight eric brown pca architects out of cambridge massachusetts we're architects for market basket and the adjacent retail building retail edition as well as the new hampshire liquor store so i hopefully the drawings speak for themselves um the the design is basically derived of, of new england rural architecture suburban rural architecture with clabbered masonry um, elements that, that uh, signify the roofs, uh, I mean, the, the entrances, the sign areas um, to break down the scale of the building um, where we're using uh, two or three different colors, a little bit reminiscent of sort of Victorian architecture that we find around New England. Let's go to the next slide, please. So three-dimensional view. The parking lot is not, um, correct i have to say but the architecture of the building is correct as you can see that we have towers at the entrances shaded canopies um, where outdoor dining can occur etc and a mix of clabbered and shingle trim boards and masonry get the next slide please Uh-oh. I think you want the liquor store. There we 
we go. See this? No. Nope. We're seeing your folder. Okay. We're not seeing the image. Got it. Okay. So I think many of you are obviously familiar with the New Hampshire liquor store. This is mainly a prototype that they're using, but again, similar materials, except uh, this has actually has the granite base, clabber, trim boards, um, New England style um, window fenestration. You have a heavy timber element at the entry. And I'd like to mention that um, one design element that's involved uh, in recent weeks is that now we're using, we're added solar panels to the east, west, and south uh, sloping roofs. North elevation and west elevation. And we have a perspective view. Hey, Heather, I'm going to, uh, I need to hop, something's going on out in front of my house here that I need to go figure out what's happening. Um, I just need to turn off my video just for a second. I'll be right back, okay? So the perspective view really does tell the story, it shows the heavy timber element at the entry, uh, the sort of barn sash um, windows where um, the racking is occurring so the windows stay up high on the west elevation, larger um, windows uh, on the south elevation, um, peak roofs, um, the signage is not part of our application tonight. And the next slide, please. So Jason, you're going to pull up that view from Route 4. So we took a Google Earth view from Route 4 and we um, we dropped in our 3D model of the market basket in, in the retail building just to get a feel for um, the view in through the trees, it's mostly open, uh, mostly sort of screened, but there are some few openings along the way where you can peek in and, and see the uh, development. And in the interest of uh, being brief, because it's late, I think we're all set with our presentation tonight. Thanks, sir. So, um, Carol, while Rich is dealing with whatever he needs to in front of his house, do you want you want to uh, run in the interim? I guess I have a James Lamp and uh, Carmine Thomas, both of whom have raised their hand. Is James Lamp with your team? Jason? Yes, he is. They're both of uh, Market Basket representatives. Okay. Uh, um, yes. Let's see. So I have allowed Carmine Thomas and James Lamp both to speak. So if either of you would like to um, share, I think Carmine Thomas, you said, was also a member of your team, correct? They are members of their team. I don't believe they're looking to speak tonight unless they can oh, okay. prove us wrong. They had, they had their hands raised, so I didn't know yeah. they wanted to. They're probably not sure of the protocol. I think they just want to make, make themselves. Okay, make themselves known. Well, yeah. either of you, if you do, you are you are um, unmuted from my end, so so you can. If I may, I have a question, a site question, if I may ask it. Um, yeah, I'm going to defer to care. Oh. I don't think Rich is back. I'm going to defer to Carol. Carol, if you're there and you'd like to uh, run the meeting while Rich is out. Okay. Um, I recognize you, Earl. Thank you, Carol. Um, back to the site itself. Um, uh, Beth had given us an update on uh, the sidewalks. And I know you talked about uh, widening of the roads and allowing for bicycle uh, traffic. Will there be striping down uh, to designate the bicycle lanes? Yeah, 
Yeah, the proposed uh, treatment, surface striping treatment would be just a typical, uh, you'd have basically a fog line, a white, a four, four inch white um, stripe that would delineate the shoulder areas and then a double solid yellow uh, center line. And that would be the striping treatment that's currently proposed. So I read in the report that there's, you know, you're going to have a couple of feet on each side with 11 feet for each lane and and two feet that would be uh, beyond the shoulder. So you would have a white line and then two feet to the curb. It would be um, four feet. So the total road is would be 30 feet wide with uh, 11 foot traveled way and a four foot shoulder uh, on each side. And that'll be delineated by paint lines. So we'll end up having a four foot. So you'll end up having a four foot shoulder and then a five foot sidewalk behind that for obviously for pedestrians. Um, All right. Thank you. I have a question as well, if I could. I recognize you, Jeff. Um, you mentioned that you've designed this to accommodate bicycles. Could you perhaps point out on the plan if you've provided any sort of bike racks or accommodations for those people that may be coming there? Um, yeah, I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to attempt to. So this is an overall view. It doesn't show the bike racks. The... Um, the site plan set, the 60 to 70 sheet of, you know, the actual drawing set, uh, permit set shows the locations. However, we've planned for them to be uh, in, one to be in this area, if everyone can see the screen up to the east of the liquor store in the central uh, area, there's a bicycle rack in front of the market basket. Uh, I believe it's here or it's here. It's close to the main entry, one of the main entry points. And further, there was a sidewalk planned. Uh, I think those were the areas where we're proposing sidewalks. Oh, sorry. Uh, bicycle racks, excuse me. Okay. So those two locations. So I'm just kind of curious, the bike rack you're proposing is on the backside of the liquor store, if I'm kind of understanding that right? Yes. Uh, is that meant to be for users specifically of the liquor store? Because wouldn't you want to kind of put that closer to the front where it's more convenient for them and perhaps uh, employees to access rather than kind of tucked out of sight in the back? Yeah, we were planning for it to be, I understand the point, um, just equidistant from the supermarket to the liquor store. Um, so I, that was the thought behind it. Um, I think I would just suggest maybe give consideration to kind of each one of the use areas when you move forward into the phase two that could have those bicycle racks so that you are facilitating easy use of the air by both employees and customers mm -hmm. um, and that they feel safe to do so that so they don't feel like they're tucked around the back so basically one at each in the front well, door area of each well, facility well or at least like you know you have the area of kind of phase two there's a cluster of four you know kind of buildings yeah. maybe there's a way to co-locate sure. you know in those four and then maybe an area for the other two with the proposed restaurant and the retail so just sure. so that you know um, because I think we all agree that if people don't feel safe, they're not going to use these areas. Um, and then you're going to yes. find bikes tied to trees or some other thing, <laughs> which becomes a safety and a, an aesthetics issue. Yeah. I do have another question as well. I did kind of take a look at the lighting uh, plan that was provided. I don't know if it's been updated to kind of take a look at this, but some of the crosswalk areas seem like the lighting might be a little bit lower than what might be typically seen as a standard. Mm -hmm. If that's something that just could kind of be taken another look at uh, as you move forward with engineering, 
to see if um, mm-hmm. that, just to make sure, like I say, there again, same kind of idea. If it, if the people don't feel safe walking the area, they're not going to. Yeah, and we want to make this whatever. safe as well. As you, I agree 100% with that. And we also want to you know, obviously make sure that those are, we don't create any issues, you know, um, in planning out the illumination levels within the specific crosswalks. Right. So we will certainly take a look at that and see if there's any adjustments that should be made. Yeah, because it'd be definitely nice if these uses, a lot of them are complementary to each other. So it'd be nice if people felt comfortable parking in one area and being able to walk to Found other a nice areas. Night. Yep, absolutely. Right. Thank you. Hey, Heather. Yes. I've got my hand up. I saw that. Okay. Carol, can you? Yes, go ahead, Suzanne. Thanks. Um, when... Um, the, the, you were scrolling around the plan. I noticed that that open space, I think that was the one you were talking about that was similar to another project is artificial turf, which I, I didn't, I couldn't actually see on the planting plan. So I guess I was wondering what, was that the open space that was affiliated with the restaurant? Yes. So how is that artificial turf going to be used? I don't know. We were thinking about it probably be used um, as just a like a small pocket park type thing, with um, which will benefit the future restaurant that we're trying to attract at that site. We will be able to have outdoor seating um, with um, as well as basically seating for pedestrians in the corners. It's really small scale, but we've attempted to capture well, the landscaping, putting some benches around the perimeter. Uh, just like a nice open space. You can see in the in the, the stuff that comes out of um, the Friendly Toast Yelp page, they were using it as like a, to play games and stuff in the area. So I would imagine that that would be something that they could use that uh, area for as well. So yeah, I guess, Jason. so uh, I guess um, in a, some of those open spaces that are, I mean, most of the landscaping is related to the parking and the um, the roads going into the site. And there were some open spaces that I'm wondering why you couldn't actually plant trees within the spaces, because I think that they would be a, a more identifiable as a as something other than street tree planting. Do you know what I'm saying? You're saying like over here? For well, us? there's um, well, there's where yeah. you've got a lot of green. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm assuming that's not all artificial grass, but I yeah. think that, um, and then there's a pocket right. Um, I can't really see it, but um, I'm not sure if you've labeled it. Um, just below the the big green space right there um, under the proposed restaurant and the retail. Yeah, right where your hand was down, down. Yeah, down right there. So I guess I, I was a little concerned about the artificial turf because there is no shade there and you obviously couldn't be having like ball games and things like that because of the road and the parking and all that other stuff. Um, I see that it looks like there might be outdoor sitting, those little X's and squares. Mm-hmm. But I, 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 I wish that you could actually incorporate more shade trees in those open spaces where there mm-hmm. is grass. And even in those corners of the artificial turf, put more trees in the corners because it, especially with artificial turf, it's going to be really, really hot. Mm-hmm. Well, we can look at uh, around this element doing something like that with some more tree wells. Um, however, this area, um, this central portion, which is a future, this is the C- a CDP plan, and um, it is meant to be uh, a, an attempt to capture the most appropriate. And I want Eric had something to say, so I'd actually like to have him chime in before I go any further. Eric, do you still have that comment? Um, well, no, I was actually just going to talk about the, um, the art, artificial turf area. We did a similar okay. thing in um, Linfield, Massachusetts. And you were, you were asking, um, there was a question about how it was going to be used. And I think you basically answered the question. It's sort of a lot, it's really a place for kids to play. A lot of times we can put out games and a ball or something and, um, 
and the parents can sit around the edges, you know, um, and kind of let their kids play a little bit. So it's just a really a gathering space. Right. But how about my comment related to the other open spaces that are woefully under landscaped? I mean, as far as adding more trees so that as you're actually coming into the site, you would notice that as an open space unless that has another purpose. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the planting plan for the remaining portion of the site. I'm not sure if this is a final planting plan that we're looking for approval tonight or if this is a future phase. So for the, the uh, relationship to the central area that we're looking at on the screen, which is effectively phase two, um, the actual, maybe, excuse me. Maybe I, maybe I could mention, uh, this is Laurie Rossi again. Um, I think the area that we're talking about is, you know, it's part of phase two. And at this point, we don't have a lot of the details for phase two and we're waiting to get to that stage where we can start talking to end users and I think at that point, we'll have a better understanding of um, what those needs are and we'll flesh out details regarding landscaping in the areas around those buildings. Well, then that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Can I, can I jump in and ask a question? Rich is back. I mean, Chairman Woodfin is back. Are you there, Rich? I thought I saw you. He's muted. I am. I'm back. Sorry. Oh, was, you're muted. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm sitting here yakking at you, and, and you couldn't even hear me. But nope. whatever's going on in front of my house, my wife is dealing with. So God help them. So that's. Uh, I'm, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I know your wife. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Be, be aware. Can I, can I ask? Go a ahead, question? Heather. Yeah. Comment. So I was just noticing like the way, and I have not looked at the planting plan, so I may be speaking out of, out of turn, but the way that you've um, illustrated them, it looks like a lot of them might be ornamental trees, and I'm not sure if that's the case or if you're just, that's But again, just is this, can you, uh, can somebody just run a mouse over this and show me where uh, phase one is? I think just phase one is just the supermarket, the uh, the top part, and the whole phase two is everything below kind of the artificial turf down below, right? Is that right? Just real quick, Heather, to answer your question, that's a comment in the staff report about the ornamentals. Oh, good. About the ornamentals, okay. But could, can somebody just tell me what phase one is on the buildings? I'm, pr Jason I'm pretty sure outlined. it's the, I'm pretty sure yeah, it's- Yeah, so, um, so, sorry, Mr. Woodfin, I tried to draw- Oh yeah, I got you. Yeah, no, that's good. No, you can see it, that's good. So that's phase one. Plus the south road, um, the south road uh, here. Okay. Where is the south uh, road? Point to the south road. <clears throat> right there. Okay. It is this uh, south. Uh, I can't I'm losing it. It's right in this yeah, area. Right there. So the road, the road itself, which comes up and obviously services the back, and then the proposed supermarket, the proposed retail, and the proposed uh, retail again. So. Or not even yes. just just those two, or, or is that third front building is part of phase no. one as well? No, the okay. third front building is not. Okay, so it's just those two buildings. So from a yes, landscape, sir. from a landscaping perspective, from a parking perspective, from a lighting, snow removal, all that stuff, all we care about right now is just phase one, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So where did we leave off, Heather? I apologize. No, it's okay. I was just going to say, and Beth said that she included in her report that um, you know, a lot of those should be shade trees, not ornamental. And, and also just that it would be great if there was enough soil volume to provide um, you know, so that they would grow. I think we, we've gotten used to seeing you know, little lollipops that never grow in parking lots, but that really isn't the intent. The intent is for them to actually grow into shade trees um, that actually provide shade because they're not aesthetic. They're supposed to actually provide shade. And soil volume is a big part of what actually makes that work. Um, so anywhere that you have room that you naturally have soil volume would be great to, but you can even just extend the soil, you know, do some under, you know, underground type soil, soil extension so that they actually have enough volume to grow. Uh, I was also just gonna say that I, I second uh, uh, member Santa Cruz's comment about the bike racks being 
closer to the entrances. So I think if you've got a bike, if you've got bike racks by the market basket, and then the ones behind the liquor store, I don't think anyone's going to use those for the market basket. And so trying to place it sort of in between the two buildings, I don't, I don't think mm. is a, a strategy that's really going to be effective. I would just move those to the front because really, if you're, if you are biking to the liquor store, God help you, biking to the liquor store, yeah. but you might want to park in front and you might not even see that there's bike racks in the back. So mm -hmm. I would just suggest sliding those around. And then when you do get to phase two, um, bike racks in the, that area would be appropriate as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the AstroTurf, you know, gathering area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any other, uh, any other comments from the board? Mr. Chairman, if I could, I just have one other quick one. Yes. I know we're not looking in any sort of detail, et cetera, at phase two, but I would just ask the development team to kind of keep in mind looking at the density and layout and placement of those such that maybe we're not coming back with a bunch of waivers and conditional use permits and whatnot for that future phase and maybe kind of think a little bit to make the process a little easier for them and the, the community and the board. Absolutely. Good points. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, any other comments from the board? <coughs> any other presentation stuff that needs to be sorted through, Heather? I think we've... Well, we have not up. opened it up to the public yet. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to make sure but we I heard, don't have we heard everything. Other... Uh, Lori, uh, have we heard any, everything from your group? Uh, yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's open up the public hearing portion of this. And uh, we have people in the audience, I'm sure, that would like to speak. If you could raise your hand or if you're in the audience listening on the phone, again, the phone number that was provided at the beginning of the meeting, um, you can call that phone number and uh, hit star nine and you'll be put into the queue. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, if you're on the line, just on the phone, just hit star nine, you'll be put in the queue. So uh, we do have a hand up, Heather, if you could uh, see who's got their hand up and we'll Welcome I do have there. someone I've just allowed to speak whose hand is up, uh, Kay Poulin. I'm not sure who it is. Okay. Well, Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Could yeah. you state your name for the record? Sure. My name is Karen Poulin. Hey, Karen, are you a, a Concord resident? I am a Concord resident, and I live at 9 Fox Run in Concord, New Hampshire, and I'm less than a mile from this project. Okay. So um, I just wanted to get on record. I did send a letter into David Cedarholm Engineering and Planning Department in, back in October, early November, with some concerns for this project. Um, you know, I, I echo Heather's, um, first off, her comment related to the ornamental trees. Um, I just want to make sure that if this project does move forward that in five years we don't have a bunch of dead trees and an empty parking lot um, as some of the other locations in Concord where parking lots and um, buildings have gone in and we end up with no shade and no trees uh, within those parking lots or they're dead, um, i.e. the target parking lot and a few others. Um, my other concern is, I, you know, I live less than a mile from here. Drainage and wetlands has always been an issue in that area. I remember when Wheelabrator went in, the city had some large issues relating to wetlands um, and permits. Um, I'm not sure if those were ever ironed out. They must have been where Wheelabrator went in, but I know that this development of this property, there have been concerns in the past and you know, I'm curious how they're moving forward now in the future um, and how those those uh, wetlands issues and, and other zoning issues have been ironed out to be putting in a project of this magnitude. So another concern I have is they're talking about bicycle lanes and pedestrians. Where are these bicycles coming from? I, I live here. I've lived here for 24 years. If you left my neighborhood, and crossed 93, you would be killed before you got to Whitney Road. There are not enough sidewalks, bike lanes, anything from this side of the highway. And no traffic study was done on this side of the highway in order to create this bicycle traffic that you speak of or pedestrian traffic. 
And also, when you look at traffic from Penacook Bosquin, there are no bike lanes. There are sidewalks. But again, what what pedestrian? I know that phase three, I think, is condominiums. But you know, you're setting this up to be a success story. Um, you know, and where is that bicycle traffic coming from that you're speaking of of these bike racks? And and I'm I'm really concerned with where where is that bike traffic coming from? Um, you know, the roundabout, kudos to you. That definitely needs to go in. That's a very dangerous area. So um, our bike lanes planned for that um, roundabout. And it, you know, another concern that I want to get on record, um, I believe there's only one police officer allotted for this sector of the city. You know, what is this going to cost taxpayers money in the future with bringing in more, you'll need more police presence in the area with all these additional uh, condominiums, um, you know, retail spaces, market baskets, restaurants. You know, I definitely have concerns with that if there's only one police um if the presence that we have in this area is one police officer for this sector also you know what we don't have is on this side of the highway 85 plus homes have been built in on this east side of concord within the last 10 to 15 years with zero traffic upgrades there are significant accidents between the Mountain Road and Hoyt Road intersection, Boyce Road and Hoyt Road intersection, and backs up, backups off of the 93 North off ramp to this particular area. These, these um, items have not been addressed. Also, these are school routes. These are school bus routes. These are where students drive to Merrimack Valley. Um, these are things that were considered. I did read the traffic study and yes, it put me to sleep at night. It was very lengthy, but I did read that traffic study, um, pretty thoroughly. So I know that, you know, you did account for days, you know, different times and days. Um, but definitely keep in mind if you've ever been in this area on a Friday night or a Sunday afternoon, the traffic is gridlocked. You do not move because all the Massachusetts traffic comes off of 93 and blocks this area to a complete gridlock where traffic does not move. Um, we can't exit our neighborhood uh, and we cannot leave on a Sunday afternoon or a Friday evening with the traffic going north. These things were not considered. I did not see any lengthy information in that traffic study regarding this issue. Also, um, you know, I'm trying to protect taxpayer future dollars. You know, I live here. I'm a taxpayer. I've been here 24 years. And I just see the fact that this side of the highway was not considered in your traffic study, that you are going to spend taxpayer dollars in the future at a substantial amount in order to bring this up to um, a necessary um, a necessary. Um, you know, appropriate traffic, if you want that traffic to come over the highway to go to these new developments in this new developed area. And, and I'm also worried about one final thing, and I know I'm going on and on, but these things need to be noted as they will cost taxpayers money. Um, the lighting, the glow at night from this development, I will see this from my home. You know, Wheelabrator itself is, is a bright location. But when you think of the additional lighting and the additional glow from this area in the sky, that also was not considered. You know, these are things, you know, maybe to you, they don't mean anything, but this affects, you know, this directly impacts my home, myself, my neighbors. Um, and I definitely think I won't be the only one complaining about these issues. So I'll wrap up with that, but if anybody wants to make any comments on the seven or eight things I mentioned, you know, these things need to be considered. Um, you know, if you're moving forward with this type of development in this area. Great, well, thank you very much for your testimony. Any uh, questions to, uh, to Ms. Poulin from the board? 
or staff. I know we I noted some of your questions and uh, we'll invite the applicant back to uh, to address any of them that they may feel that need to be addressed. Um, regarding lighting in particular, it, it's a big issue and it's uh, it's something that the board takes very seriously and we do look at the types of lighting and the, the friendly sky, the night sky lighting and things like that. So uh, those, although aren't addressed in particular details sometimes in a meeting like this, uh, they are addressed in the application and, and the types of lighting that are used. So we'll, uh, we'll make note of the things that you put here and uh, we'll see if the applicant can give you some clarity once we get through the uh, the other attendees who have questions. Thank, thank you so th thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Heather, who's next? Um, we've got uh, see Mark, Mark Varney, if we could. Yeah, Mark Varney, um, I'm allowing you to speak. And if you could take this. You you're now unmuted. Okay, if you can, can you hear me? If you could take yes. Ms. Poulin off, Heather. All right. Uh, my name is Mark Varney. I am the planning board chair for Bosquin. Um, and we have we have had quite a bit of discussion about this project on, in, in our meetings. Um, and first off, um, the majority of the comments are all positive from our side. Um, I understand a lot of the comments that the, the person right before me spoke about. Um, I can't speak for that side of the highway, unfortunately. I can tell you that I feel that there'll be a lot of pedestrian as well as bicycle traffic coming over from the Pentecook Bosquin area. Um, I know there's a large group of people that ride their bikes that way anyway, and I'm sure we'll have some traffic going that way. Um, I just want to say that from what we've seen, um, it's going to be positive for us. I know it's going to increase our traffic load, and we've talked about that because we'll have people coming in more from probably from Webster and Salisbury headed to that market basket and things like that instead of going over towards Warner and that way. Um, but I do. I, I just wanted to say that from the from the Bosquin side, we think it's a positive thing for the for the communities. Great. Um, any any concerns? Any anything that came up from the negative side of it? That you'd care to share? Um, the the only again you know the um, the lighting is an issue. However, not so much for Bosquin residents, um, but as as the woman before me spoke, I'm sure the lighting is is a concern. I know whenever we do any projects here in town, um, our our uh, policy is downward lighting. And I'm, I'm assuming that's probably what, what you folks have as well. I didn't notice that in the plan, but I'm sure that's what it is, which helps somewhat. Um, but again, it's always a concern. For us, negatively, I didn't see any other than a little slight increase in traffic coming through town. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Varney, for your testimony. Any questions for Mr. Varney from the board or staff? No? Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. Very good, thank you. Uh, anybody else got a hand up, Heather? I can't believe nobody else wants to talk. You got uh, a lot of people out there. If anybody else would like to speak, uh, uh, please raise your hand now and uh, make yourself known. Uh, Let's see if any, have... any more members of the public on. Actually, there are a few, but not many. Okay. Uh, any other uh, comments or questions or concerns from the board or staff? I'll invite the applicant back in if we can, Heather. Um, we'll leave the public hearing open, but uh, we'll invite uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Rossio and any of the, uh, the uh, applicants to come back in. Um, again, maybe addressing the questions regarding the wetlands. I don't know that I saw wetlands on the plan. Beth, can you can you give us a quick update as far as wetlands go? I know I don't know if there's wetlands involved in this or not. There were wetlands on the property. They've received DES permits to fill wetlands mm -hmm. um, on that property, but there's also uh, existing wetlands that are protected by buffers. Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, again, regarding the bikes, I think bikes are, are more of a, of a future, a future piece that we want to make sure we've got addressed for future development down Whitney road, down towards um, the south, um, and again, I think Heather, you'd made a comment regarding a uh, a uh, uh, 
sidewalk to nowhere um, type of mentality where we put sidewalks in just to put them in. So uh, if we put those sidewalks in, not that they got bikes in particular, but certainly, you know, some of the biking and, and sidewalks is a, a little bit more futuristic than anything. Is that right? David? Yeah, can I speak to that? Sure. Um, uh, from the Bosco in direction, there are um, 10 foot wide shoulders on Route 4 currently. Um, so from that direction, there's uh, uh, really nice provisions for bicycles uh, from the Bosco in direction. Um, from the east side of uh, 17, it's, uh, it's a little less so. There's uh, eight foot shoulders on the north side of Route 4. Uh, and, the and the shoulder pinches out a little bit when you get closer to, um, uh, to the 93 bridge, um, but pretty much there is a, a continuous bike lane um, all the way in each direction. Uh, the sidewalk, there's currently a sidewalk from the Hannah Dustin uh, park and ride um, all the way to Hannah Dustin Drive. So we are, are, this project actually proposes to connect up this, that sidewalk between Hannah Dustin Drive and Whitney Road. Um, and, uh, and of course, everybody has felt that it's been important to include full bicycle and pedestrian accommodations around the roundabout mm -hmm. so that um, bicycles and pedestrians can either go east and west on Route 4, but also get from Whitney Road to Canterbury on Old Boys. So, um, you know, uh, we're expecting there'll probably be bicycles and pedestrians coming from Canterbury. So we want to make, make sure there are provisions there. Great. Um, and then the lighting was the other question. I don't think we've seen a light package. Um, have we, have Beth? The lighting plan should be part of your package. Okay. I don't remember seeing it, but full cutoffs and all the normal stuff that we normally see with lighting, right? That, I mean, we'll yeah. use it as much as we can. Yeah, we have uh, submitted a lighting plan okay. that adheres to the ordinance, uh, full cutoffs, no spill. No spill into the right away. Uh, so, just uh, Jason, if you can, or somebody, give us a quick, a, a quick um, layman's uh, explanation of what a full cutoff is, so people have a good understanding of what we're talking about. And again, not you know, not too detailed, but just to give people an idea of, you know, the, yeah. the, friend, the friendly aspect of it. So it's a night night sky friendly. So the the actual head. <clears throat> The points down the photometrics, which is the light, points down to the ground and is cut off um, by the fixture so that there's no uh, vertical. It does not go vertical. It basically shines right down in your face and does not shine up or sideways. Well, it says sideways, but not up to the sky. Yeah. Uh, it's been common design practice for about at least 10 or 15 years. And so the only difference is now everyone's using LEDs, which are more efficient ha heads. Uh, so that's what we're, we're proposing. Great. And again, I, if, for the listeners, more than anything, I think it's, it's, it's not going to eliminate the glow, but it'll, it should, you know, get it to a point where it's as, as minimal as possible. Um, yes. So there's uh, one other question I had. No, I didn't actually, that was it on that. Um, so let's, uh, do we have any other questions? Oh, yeah, David, David, go ahead, Derek, David. I also wanted to um, address the concerns that uh, Karen Poulin had about, um, you know, gridlock in her neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, the entire purpose, well, the reason that they have gridlock is because everybody's avoiding the, the congestion on weekends posed by the restrictions of 93 through Concord all, all the way down through Bow. Um, DOT's I-93 widening project is proposed to address exactly that. So, um, you know, everybody should support that project going forward. Um, and hopefully someday DOT's uh, project will happen and, uh, and that should address those congestion issues that people have uh, in Karen Poulin's neighborhood, Mountain Road, all through East Concord. Everybody's trying to avoid the, the congestion on 93 on weekends. So the planners in Tilton will be cursing us uh, as, the, as the traffic backs up into Tilton and, and it's going through on three or four lanes on our end. So. <laughs> if I can add something. 
Yes, uh, go ahead, Laurie. Yeah. This is Laurie Rossi again. I just wanted to address one of the comments um, made regarding condominiums. Um, there's been a common misconception that part of this project involves residential because of the word condominiums. And we'll be oh, yeah. talking about the condominiums in the next um, the next application, but that's actually a land condominium for commercial development only. Just want to That was my that. other point. I had one more and I, I couldn't remember what it was. And I went to look at it. It wasn't there. So, uh, and Thank again, I, we, we referenced the term condominiums more for just the 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 structure of the of the of the land and how it's going to be used not particularly traditional condos and, and apartments and things like that so uh, i see miss poolin has put her hand back up if we could uh, open her up rich you've got suzanne smith myers had her hand up. oh i'm sorry suzanne no you never see my hand oh because you're as a <laughs> panelist i'm looking at the i'm looking at the attendees i saw her i'm sorry oh, that's suzanne. okay well um i think you might have missed the comment that heather made and i am very supportive um, of the staff uh, really looking very, very closely at the planting details and the plant planting sites for these trees so that they are um, sustainable. If you, um, I, I did notice on one of the plant lists that they were planting three and a half inch caliper trees, which require, um, an, even initially, a huge planting site. And I agree with the um, uh, Karen, who is the community um, speaker, that there, it makes no sense when you look at some of these shopping centers that the plants, you know, they're planting sycamores in three foot wide um, planting sites on Fort, Eddy, on Fort Eddy Road. So if the staff can look really, really carefully at the planting details and require that, you know, that some of those areas are, you know, amended you know they're actually troughed out with good planting soil we won't we won't have that problem i don't think so and and obviously that because the um approvals are based on the landscaping requirements if the plants do die they have to be replaced but it's better to do it right the first time so i would really support that and encourage um that communication with the um, engineers and with the staff. Great. Uh, thanks, Suzanne. Heather, do you have a comment? I did have a, have a comment. Um, is, my, is my sound okay? Because sometimes it gets wonky. Yep. Right? Okay. Uh, I, did, I just wanted to point out that we, that we have, since the beginning of talking about this project, have consistently had a lot of requests and people expressing concern that we do ensure that appropriate pedestrian and bicycle connectivity is provided. And that's from everywhere from the planning board to uh, the, the TPAC members um, and members of the community in the first public hearings. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of people out there who are concerned. Uh, e even people have just sent us in letter uh, emails, sent us emails and comments saying, you know, make sure that you're, you're doing, you're providing this kind of connectivity. And so I think they've you know, between the city and VHB and the applicant, you know, tried to make sure that they're that they're doing that or made that a priority. Um, I also just wanted to make a comment about the police. She had mentioned the police, um, and we don't we don't have extensive coverage really throughout the city. I think it's something like eight to eleven police officers at any given time for the entire city of Concord. Um, all of Loudon Road only has two officers. Um, and there's one that's one for the south side and one for the north side, and that includes all residential and commercial development um, in all of those areas. And it's not just Loudon Road. They, they they do the one guy does the north side of Loudon Road, like all the way up to uh, you know Boscoen basically, and the other guy does south of Loudon Road all the way. You know, so so this this area would it's true that it will it will probably require you know more. Uh, coverage, uh, or it will have more, it will require uh, more attention than it did before, but it's probably not going to um, reach the level of intensity that some of the officers already already have throughout the city um, in terms of in terms of resources. So I, I think we're probably a long way away from affecting um, city resources in terms of police, uh, because as I said, there, there are already officers that are covering much more intense areas in other areas of the city. Great, thank you. Okay, and, and again, I think uh, 
Uh, Ms. Poulin had her hand up if you want to. Yes, uh, I'll allow her to speak again. Yep, go ahead. Your your mic is open. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so just one final comment. You know, Jason, those lights are called dark sky compliant lights. Um, and um, I just want to mention, you know, I'd love to invite you guys over here to my home and hop on a bike. And I'd love to see you, um, you know, Dave Cederholm mentioned um you know that the road is wide enough for bikes but what you're not thinking of is those ramps for the on and off ramps for 93 south um the loop and when there's absolutely no stopping or yielding try to take a bike across that i've done this you know i'm not against this project happening at all i mean i think what the rossios and the development companies are doing is is a great thing however it would be great if it was accessible from here and i would love to invite each of you over here to hop on your bike and and take that ride because it is not a fun ride it's a dangerous ride and you would not want your you wouldn't want to say to your children run to the store for me and grab me this because it is not safe from this side of the highway um, and there is no sugar coating what I see living here and it needs to be addressed. And I mean, you will see that this will cost taxpayers money in the future what? in order to make these upgrades. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, great. Uh, what do we have I'm looking to see if there's anybody else, Heather? I don't see anybody else's hand up. Uh, Last chance, or we got to have Beth, but I'm going to hold on to you, Beth, for just a second. I just want to make sure there's no other member of the audience that has uh, any questions or concerns. I'm not okay. seeing anything. Beth? I just wanted to mention the CNHRPC letter. I don't know if we want to read any of those into the record, any of their recommendations. No, we did get some letters today from, uh, from uh, a couple of different letters, right? There was two, I think. Beth, was there two I, letters? There was just one. Was there just one? Two pages, maybe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we did get those in our packet as well, um, and we don't. I, do you think anything needs to be read into the record regarding the comments? I'm just. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. I can just read, just summarize yeah, ahead, real quick summarize what their recommendations. Yep, please. Um, they're in support of the measures to improve the roundabout. And who, just for the record, who was yes. who? Who was this from? This is from. Um, just so it's from the Central New Hampshire Regional Planning Commission. Right. So it's the Beth, staff at CNHRPC that put together. Yeah. Beth, could you explain what that is for people in the audience who might not know? Yeah. It's the local regional planning commission. So since this is a development of regional impact, um, they provide input on this because they oversee the area that surrounds Concord, Bosquin, and Canterbury. So they comment on any impacts that would potentially occur um, within the city, but also the surrounding area. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, for, thanks, Matt. So uh, could you give us a summary of that letter, Beth? Sure. Um, so I might just share it just so people can look at it while I'm, they don't listen to me. Um, but they're supportive of the roundabout. Um, they recommend um, pedestrian connections just west of the development um, to be constructed to guarantee safe access for pedestrians and recommend winter maintenance. Um, support measures to protect Burnham Brook Corridor. They are recommending um, as partial mitigation for air quality impacts, underground wiring for any future electrical vehicle charging stations. The potential visual impacts on the neighborhood along Shoestring Road and southerly end of Old Voice Road should be considered during sign approval process. And that'll be um, a future application by the, app, by the developer. And then considering noise mitigation measures along the north side of um, for Route 4 parallel to Shoestring Road. Okay. And again, point to their pedestrian connections to the existing sidewalk network just west of the development should also be constructed to guarantee safe access for pedestrians, winter maintenance of the off-site and offs on the on-site and off-site pedestrian facility should be considered for year-round safe access. So again, I, I think bike access, pedestrian access, sidewalks, and, and good planning all the way around are going to be the points. I don't recall seeing anything regarding underground wiring. Um, and, and I read this note before, and I must have missed that. But has that been addressed at all anywhere? I haven't. I just 
saw this this afternoon as well. Yeah. So I don't know, um, and I have not shared this with the applicant yet. Um, I'll Can forward I that to you. Did you see it, Lori? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, no, I didn't see it, um, but I guess we did fail to mention in the presentation that we, um, first of all, all the conduit is underground uh, throughout the project. We've been working uh, very hard with Unitil to plan that out throughout the site. And um, there is a, a good portion of the site that will have electric vehicle charging stations. It's along the Route 4 uh, frontage um, over by the proposed liquor store. I think at this point, we're looking at uh, 12 to 16 stations that will be um, installed initially. And we've had um, requests to plan for more. So we're definitely putting an electric vehicle charging station. Great, great. Okay, any other questions from the board? <coughs> Excuse me. No. Okay, <clears throat> well, we will uh, close the public hearing. I don't see anybody else's hand up. So we'll close the public hearing and we'll uh, move back to our package here. Um, have we added anything, Beth or Heather or um, staff from David's perspective as far as anything changed in <clears throat> in the um, in the conversation here? We haven't added anything that needs to be that needs to be pointed out in our uh, in our in our uh, in our uh, recommendation piece, is there? Um, I don't think there was. Just the sidewalk, if we want to, if the board would consider a waiver to the sidewalk requirement to okay. allow them to construct south of um, Merchant's Way as part of phase two. Yeah, so again, so give us, the, so phase one was the top part of that where you've got the market basket and the liquor store. Um, I mean, there's no sense in putting a sidewalk in until there's something there to I, I don't know. I, I mean, should there be a sidewalk? I don't know. What does the staff have any thoughts on it as far as is a waiver something that you guys would support in pushing it off to phase two? I understand um, when I had spoken with Lori today, and I understand that it's pretty much similar to their waiver for not planting on the street trees. They do have a plan to connect into the sidewalk as part of phase two. So if there's grade changes that need to occur, um, you know, that may cause damage to the sidewalk. And also it's it's a sidewalk to nowhere until phase two gets constructed, unless people want to walk to Wheel of Raider. Um, but I, they, I mean, I don't think it's a deal breaker if we do not grant the waiver. Okay. And is the waiver in our packet here? It is not. This is just something that came up after okay. that staff report. So in our, in our packet, we've got 7.1, which is to grant the following waivers, which are, uh, waiver to section 19 access driveway standards waiver to section 1603 chapter 11 and 2706 placement of landscape materials to not provide street trees so we would add that additional waiver to not provide the <clears throat> not provide the uh, sidewalk until phase two commit uh, phase two is completed or into make it part of phase two yep so i would recommend um say a waiver to section 21.01 .01 of the site plan regulations to not construct the sidewalk on Whitney Road south of Merchants Way until phase two. <clears throat> okay. Mr. Chairman, if I could. Yes, certainly, go ahead. Uh, I have a question because I'm looking at the plan and I'm seeing that they're off site improvements being done by the city, which are the roundabout at Merchants Way. And that sidewalk is shown coming down Whitney for a certain portion and then just dead ending in a nowheresville. I personally wouldn't want to support moving that to phase two. I would like to see that sidewalk taken all the way to interchange and properly ended so that you don't leave pedestrians just out to a grass strip in the middle of nowhere. At least it connects back to a drive where they could then come back into interchange way if they chose to. Okay. Is that correct, Beth? That's fine. Yep. yep. So, um, I mean, they haven't officially requested a waiver. This was just something we talked about again today. So it, we could change it to adding a comment that the sidewalk shall be continued um, along the entire property line to interchange drive. Okay. Is that, Jeff, does that work? Yeah, I just, if you understand what I'm saying, it's, it's, no, it's got a dead end somewhere, yeah. and I'd rather not have a dead end in between two driveways where people then will just maybe try and cross the grass open area 
yeah. into the site, it, it'd be better to direct them. Okay. And let them dead end further down. Well, at least if yeah. they're, they're, if they're on, there's a four foot <clears throat> shoulder proposed along interchange way. If there's no actual sidewalk at that point, at least they can walk in the, the shoulder if they so choose rather than just being led to a grass to nowhere. Okay. So does that need to be done as a waiver, Beth? Should I? Nope. It would just waiver? be, um, that they need to comply with section 21.01. Okay. So let's, uh, let's address 7.1, which is the waiver, uh, the waivers, um, we've got in our packet 7.1, which is to uh, waiver to section 19 access to driveway standards to allow for 30 foot drives, um, merchants way interchange drive where 28 feet is required uh, to accommodate a four foot wide bicycle lane and better circulation and turning movements for larger trucks and emergency vehicles. Uh, waiver to section 1603.11, which is signs to provide a sign package at a later date. Um, and a waiver to section 2706, uh, placement of landscape materials to not provide street trees along a portion of the northern side of interchange drive uh, where the conditions that the street trees be planted as part of phase two or by November 15th, 2024, whichever is sooner. And then uh, the, do we need to do a waiver to comply with or should it just be part of the conditions? Okay, so we'll just those, are the waivers. The precedent yeah, those are the waivers that are outlined there. Are someone like to make a motion to grant those waivers as outlined? As so moved. Second. Motion was made by Councilor Pierce, seconded by David Fox. All those in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodfin. Aye. Member Hicks. Aye. Member Fox. Aye. Councilor Pierce. Aye. Member Regan. Aye. Member Santa Cruz. Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Foss. Aye. Member Smithmeyer. Aye. Member Rosenberger. Aye. Okay, so that motion passes. We've got uh, item 7.2, which is to grant a conditional use permit in accordance with section 28-7-11 chapter F of the zoning ordinance to allow for a 130 foot separation from existing driveway where 200 feet of separation is required. Would someone like to make a motion to grant that conditional use permit as outlined? I'll make that motion, Mr. Chairman. I'll second. second it. Motion was made by uh, Matt Hicks and seconded by Jeff Santa Cruz. Uh, all those in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodfin. Aye. Member Hicks. Aye. Member Fox. Aye. Councilor Pierce. Aye. Member Regan. Aye. Member Santa Cruz. Aye. Member Rosenberger. Aye. Member Smithmeyer. Aye. And Vice Chair Fox. Aye. Okay, 7.3 is to grant ADR approval for the site plan and the building elevations for phase one of the multi-phase development. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to grant ADR approval as outlined? Moved. Second. Motion, motion was made by Councilor Pierce and seconded by uh, Matt Hicks. All those in favor by roll call. Member uh, Chairman Woodfin. Aye. Member Hicks. Aye. Member Hicks. Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Councilor Pierce? Aye. Member Regan? Aye. Vice Chair Foss? Aye. <clears throat> Member huh. Rosenberger? Aye. Member Smith Meyer? Aye. Okay, and then uh, item 7.4, Heather, can you give me a little clarity here? It's uh, staff recommends that the planning board provide feedback on the comprehensive development plan CDP attachment and, def and determine if the layout revisions are acceptable for approval. Um, given uh, the conversations and the discussion we've had, do you need anything more from us regarding that? Yeah, I think you meant Beth. Beth. Yeah, so um, we didn't want to sway in either direction we just wanted the discussion to happen tonight so if is a, if you all agree with the um amendments then you would uh, grant approval of the cdp amendment okay so any discussion regarding the cdp amendment or would someone like to make a motion to grant that amendment as outlined i'll move approval second motion made by john and uh, seconded by david uh, all those in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodfin. Aye. Member Regan. Aye. Councilor Pierce. Aye. Vice Chair Foss. Aye. Member Santa Cruz. 
Aye. Member Rosenberger? Aye. Member Smithmeyer? Aye. Member Fox? Aye. Member Hicks? Aye. I gotta find a better way to, to read this and not look down and look up this way, but I can't do it, I apologize. So uh, item 7.5, which is to grant major site plan approval for the proposed multi-phase development, including site and building improvements associated with an 80,000 square foot supermarket with attached 22,483 square foot retail and separate 13,000 square foot pad under phase one concept for eight mixed commercial buildings for phase two and concept for industrial development of a cell tower under phase three at one Whitney road the gateway performance and industrial districts subject to the following precedent conditions noted below and those are outlined in precedent conditions one through nine and subsequent conditions one through six. Uh, Beth, do we need to modify or add any precedent or subsequent conditions in there? Um, yeah, I would just add a precedent condition. I'll renumber it, but just to, um, the applicant shall comply with section 21.01 of the site plan regulations to continue the sidewalk along the entire length of the property line. Okay, so why don't we make that precedent condition 10 and uh, 2101 to continue the sidewalk on the, uh, the entire uh, the entire length um would someone like to make a motion to grant oops hold on a second make sure i, get oh, I just want, can i just clarify one thing yeah. entire along whitney road along whitney road sorry yes on on that uh, precedent condition 10 right yes correct okay so would someone like to make a motion to grant major site plan approval as outlined so moved second, second. Motions made by Council Pierce, seconded by, I think, Suzanne, I heard your voice, right? Yep. Uh, seconded by Suzanne. All those in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodman. Aye. Member Regan. Aye. Member uh, Councilor Pierce. Aye. Vice Chair Foss. Aye. Member Smithmeyer. Aye. Member Rosenberger. Aye. Member Santa Cruz. Aye. Member Hicks. Aye. Member Fox. Aye. Okay, that motion carries and that is done. We are done with that uh, that piece of it. So thank you everyone for that uh, uh, that piece. And I know just speaking from the from my perspective, I've seen the work that staffs put into it and uh, uh, the Rossios have been uh, have been good to deal with. So thank you everyone for your help in getting this uh, getting this project at least off the ground. So we're through to that piece and we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is item 7G. So 7G is uh, TF Moran on behalf of Bradley Whitney, Jennifer Habel and Interchange Development requesting major subdivision approval uh, to create five land condominium units for property off Whitney Road and Gateway Performance District. Uh, okay. So we, uh, I don't believe this is, no, this was previously determined complete. Uh, and the development of reading on tax, and we do recommend the public hearing be open. Okay, so we'll open the public hearing. Welcome the same folks back to the table that were here before. Anybody new coming into the uh, coming into this discussion? Um, I don't know if the Rossios are still there. Yes, sir. People are still here. Do you want a staff update? Uh, yeah, can we get a staff update and any if they want to hop in, um, we can make them panelists or let them speak as well. But yeah, why don't we get a quick staff update? Sure. So this is um, the relatively simple, just five land unit condominium where they came before us last month for the um, mat <laughs> for the um, determination of completeness. It was a six unit that has since been revised. It's now five units. Um, the only thing major not hugely major that needs to be addressed before approval is um, the right of way needs to be negotiated with the city. So that'll be updated on future iterations of the condominium plan. Okay. And does anything need to be outlined in that, uh, in our approval or process as far as that it is in there? It's already addressed okay. in the engineering Great. comments. Great. Okay. Um, do we need to get an update from the applicant or are we, do we, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? I, Lori, I don't know if you want to, offer anything more to the equation or, or have anything that you'd like to add to it or? Uh, nothing at this time, but we're here to answer any questions. Okay, if you have them. So we do have a public hearing component, so we will open it up for any uh, any member of the audience that has a question or concern 
uh, regarding this condo development, uh, excuse me, the condominium uh, division, uh, land, land condominiums. Uh, does anybody in the audience have a question regarding this? No hands. So, no hands. Um, so we will uh, see if anybody, uh, any of the board members have any questions. If not, we'll close the public hearing and- uh, Mr. Chairman, I, yeah, I do have a question. Ahead, I Jeff. just wanna get clarification. When you say the right of way still needs to be worked out, um, will the right of way that's anything that's required for the roundabout at Route 4 and Whitney Road require anything deeded over to the state because of the, um, the de design? Or is that all still going to be city? Um, that's a good question. Carlos, um, Deputy City Manager Baia, is on the phone. I don't know if he <laughs> wants to be put on the spot for that. Or Dave, do you know Dave Cedarholm? If he's still on? I see yeah. David is still on, so we can put David on the spot earlier. We'd rather put David on the spot than we would Carlos. So, uh, <laughs> Dave, if you don't have anything, don't say, you don't have to say anything. But if you do know, that would be great to fill us in some details. I believe all the roundabout improvements happened within the existing Route 4 right away, which is 300 feet wide. Um, and uh, there is uh, an adjustment to the right away on Whitney um, only because the roundabout is a little wider at Merch's Way. Um, and so the right away uh, actually increases over there. But um, to my knowledge, uh, there, will, there won't be any adjustments to DOT's right away. So no, no Could, deeds or anything that needs to go from the state side. Jeff? Well, I just, if you could, I, I just, I'm looking at the plan now and it looks like there's a corner of the existing property between Whitney Road, the site, and Route 4, where it, that property corner actually sticks out into the two lanes of the roundabout. And so that's where I'm just, I'm not saying it's a, you know, just if maybe the comment can be confirmed that there's just the, the way we approve it just says the coordination with the city and the state. And just, I just want to make sure we don't miss that. And then the state comes back later and says there's something they need to do and it bogs things down. I want to make sure this, you know, kind of goes through smoothly. I appreciate that. We'll uh, we'll definitely look at that and keep that in mind. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No. So recommendation wise, we've got three point one, which is to grant a major subdivision approval for the lot merger and five unit condominium subdivision at Whitney Road, subject to the following. Precedent conditions, which are outlined in precedent conditions one through eight with 8A, B, and C, as well as uh, nine. Any other precedent conditions need to be added based on discussion, Beth, or are we good to go with that? I think we're good to go. It, um, engineer will look into the right of way. Our general comment is that all right of way will be addressed. So I know that um, the state has been actively involved in this entire process. So, okay. So, should we put that in as a precedent condition or we'll just leave it at know that, know that staff's going to review? Yeah, it'll just be covered under the to address all engineering comments. Okay. Perfect. Uh, okay. Would someone like to make a motion to grant that uh, major subdivision approval as outlined? No vote. Motions made by Council Pierce. Second. Do we have a second? Seconded by Matt Hicks. All those in favor by roll call. Chairman Woodfin. Aye. Member Santa Cruz. Aye. Member Hicks. Aye. Member Fox. Aye. Councilor Pierce. Aye. Member Regan. Aye. Uh, Member Rosenberger. Aye. Member Smithmeyer. Aye. Vice Chair Foss. Aye. Okay, motion carries, uh, and that completes our public hearing section of the evening. Uh, again, item 7H and 7I are off the agenda for tonight. We heard at a later date. Um, actually, 7H will be heard at a later date. 7I, uh, Nobis uh, Group on behalf of Bricksmo will be heard at our next uh, meeting on January 20th. Um, <clears throat> and that brings us to other business. Uh, item eight on our agenda, Heather, is uh, Lelise Design Resale request yeah. approval. Is that on the agenda or off the agenda? We just wanted to, it's, uh, you know, they postponed to next month, but it's not something that requires notification. So you didn't need to make any motions to postpone it to next month. Okay. Um, they just requested to come back with, diff with different designs. They're supposed to okay. go to ADR, or, or I think they're supposed to come actually to the board. 
Um, so anyway, in any case, they request to postpone and they'll be back next month. Okay. Um, and I think that's it, right? Any other well, I business? just want to oh, give did I have did, an update. Yeah, I did want to give a short update and that not in no by no means the type of extensive discussion that we had last month, but um, at the board's recommendation, I uh, cannot keep talking with Matt Hicks having rage here. <laughs> Beautiful, Matthew. I'm sorry, Great. my mind just went completely Keep it on. Uh, Keep it on. <laughs> um, and so I did go to uh, ADR and I talked to them about the architectural design or, or the um, design standards that we're recommending in the code. Um, stop, now there's a Look puppy. Come on, people, it's late. You gotta help me focus I'm listening, here. Heather, we've I'm got, listening. We've got puppies now. <laughs> oh, look at the cute puppy. Oh, oh. You, know, you don't want to see what I'll come up with now. No, 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 no. Focus, else. people, focus. All right, back <laughs> to Heather. Back to Heather. Back to Heather. Uh, so I, and I also talked to Chris Carley, partly because he's an architect, but partly because he's also the chair of the zoning board. Um, and so I had really good discussions and it was interesting, you know, the, the, the residential architects were not in favor of any, of any design stuff, but the things they were in favor were much more onerous, uh, and, um, restrictive than what I was, than what we were proposing than what really? was in the code. Really? Um, yeah. So, so one of the residential architects said, no, no design. Um, you know, we're not in support of, of design standards, but you know what you should do instead, what would be a better idea is to require all residential building permits to be stamped by a licensed architect. Oh, yeah. So that's going to cost a lot more money. And, you know, basically he said, no, we don't need any standards in the code, just hire me. <laughs> you know? yeah. Then the other residential architect, and I don't, and I, I'm only, I just noticed a pattern and I found it like, yeah. you know, entertaining. Uh, so the other residential architect said, no, I'm not supportive of any of these standards, um, but we should have every, what well, a better idea is to have every residential billing permit come through ADR. <laughs> so again, no. you know, much more cumbersome for an applicant than just simply, so the three non-residential architects said, yeah, let's, uh, these are, this is a good idea. It's a, it's a good idea to have some, some guidelines. So um, I spoke with uh, Liz Hengen pretty at, at, at some length and um, she was really helpful. Um, Chris Carley, you know, he's not super in support of, of these types of standards either. You know, he pointed out a good architect is, uh, you know, a good designer is going to do good no matter what your codes are. And somebody who's trying to cut corners and, and maximize not aesthetics, but some other thing, you know, financially or, or whatever, is going to find ways to loopholes to, um, you know, stymie your best efforts to have some a certain aesthetic created. Um, but what I thought was a really great uh, compromise was um, having them having them in the code, but allowing for flexibility with architectural design review. So in a way, we're saying so. My new proposal <laughs> that I'm going to suggest to the consultants, if you if you all think this is a good compromise, so a glazing on windows completely out. There was no support for that. The front door. My perception was there was sort of a 50-50 support for that. Um, so my recommendation would be, yes, we include the front door. Um, there was a, a lot of people that were strongly in support of that for the purposes of streetscape enhancement um, and just having a baseline standard uh, to improve the aesthetics of the neighborhood and to create a streetscape there. Um, so if somebody did want to put their front door someplace else, they would just apply for uh, design. They'd have to go through design review application, which is our cheapest application. It's the easiest one to do. Um, it's basically you just go to design review and say, I want to do this instead. And then, you know, if there's a good reason for it, you know, then, then it comes before the board and the board would make the approval. Um, same thing on the garages. So I think there was a lot of support for the location of the, um, the regulation of, a, of the garages and where the garages are. The consultant had actually recommended garages go 20 feet back from the front facade of the house which I thought, I, I didn't even get to that with you guys, but I sort of thought, oh, that's, that's a little excessive. And, and uh, Liz also felt like, we don't really need 20 feet. What if it's just like six feet? I, and I noticed that several of my precedent examples of, of ideal um, garage scenarios were about six feet back. And I do have another example that I saw just yesterday that I took a picture to show you to say, hey, this meets, you know, this doesn't look that different and it meets the requirement and it accomplishes what we want it to accomplish. Um, so the proposal would be that the garage has to be a minimum of six feet, feet back from the front facade of the house, but
But again, if there was some compelling reason why it needed to be in front for some grading or slope reason, um, that they would just have to go through design review and, and get the planning board to approve that. Um, now, let me just point out, if there's a large development, because the code, um, our code administrator was concerned about, like, what if you have a, a 50 lot development and they want an alternative layout, does every single building lot have to come and get a condition use permit? And the answer would be no, you know, because when there's a large development, it's a major site plan, they come through planning and they give us prototypes for the houses. And so it would come through planning and they would get it for the whole project, uh, you know, the, the, the approval for the whole project and they wouldn't need, every single property owner would not need to come in for every building permit. And, and, and Heather, what, what district is this for? Everything but the RO. Everything but RO. Yep. Okay. And I thought that that was a great idea because some of the most egregious sort of what we might consider offenses or things that we might be trying to prevent um, are in the R20 district. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of them are closed in downtown that we want to maintain the character, but especially yeah. with the garages, um, you know, some of the of the scenarios that I think nobody wants to propagate are in the R20 district. Um, and I don't think the front door location, you know, should really be a problem uh, in, out right. there in that yeah. district. Okay. All right. So any discussion regarding that? Um, again, Matt, we'll lead off with Matt because... He's got the lead. You got a red nose. You got to have the lead. <laughs> are we going to have more time to talk? I mean, it's kind of late. Are we going to have more time to talk about this? Well, um, the the process right now is that we're hoping to bring the entire document to the board um, next month for a recommendation. Yeah. So that's what we're hoping for because we want to get this adopted before the budget cycle gets really kicked off. Um, so that's why I brought it last month and followed up with it very quickly and had a whole lot of conversations um, between now and last month to try to come up with this particular issue. Um, this has kind of been the main issue that like among staff that we've sort of not been able to work out. Um, uh, so I, I think that I was hoping to come to, to get the majority of the board's consensus that, yeah, that's a good idea. If we, we put it in the code and then we give flexibility with the design review um, so that they don't need to get variances, basically. And, and I, think I would that's just the say for me, you go rich. I think that the, the underlying issue is the not, the not getting variances. Anything, you know, anything we're doing here to say, well, let's set up all of this, do all this work on a new code. And if we don't like it, then they can get a variance on it. I mean, that's what we don't want to have happen. Right. So, exactly. I mean, if, it, if it can be done at ADR and just done from the approval process through, through the board, that's ideal. I think that's a yeah. that's a good compromising solution because you're not going to come to consensus on whether it's six feet back or four feet back or whether it's even or whatever the garage piece is. But a good you know the good piece of it will be um, we can approve it at ADR and go through the board level. Yeah, and the, ahead, the idea is to set a standard to say this is what right. we want. Right. But if this doesn't work for whatever reason, and you've got some amazing other idea. Yeah. you know, come through design review yeah. because we don't typically have developers coming in, like insisting on certain building types. Like no. they often call me up and say, what do you want? What do you think yeah. works here? Yeah. Um, so they're very amenable and open to alternative, you know, to, to designs that the city wants to see. In most cases. Yeah. Yeah. Teresa, did you have a comment? Yeah. I still have a major problem with the front door issue. And so the compromise on that really doesn't work for me. Um, as far as the garage, if you can put it behind the front of the house, the facade, that works. Because I think, you know, at this point, we've got too many garages in front of beautiful facades. I think the character of downtown and Concord, Concord is its eclecticness. And I think we're trying to make it a cookie cutter. And I, you know, I, I, and I think we're taking away, in some cases, people's uh, private property rights. And I just don't, I'm just not, not in favor. I hate to say it. Well, I, I agree with a lot of what Teresa is saying. And I, I kind of look at this, um, uh, what, what about this option when, you know, people have the garages that you enter from the side and not from the front and, to that, would even be fine. that would be fine, by the way, as long as the front of the garage is not facing the side is fine. You missed the presentation last last month, Suzanne, but I showed a bunch of pictures of that. No, like, I was here. Oh, I was, you, you was there. Yes, oh, I don't was. remember. So, yeah, the the, 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 the side facing, um, you know, is, is is different because you're not having the 
literally the garage right there. Well, you know, and I, I don't know. I just feel like you could, I mean, yes, the garage looks better set back. It looks better. Anything looks better when it's sticking out 20 feet in front of the front door. But sometimes, I, you know, I just don't know that we should have that much control. And I think that if you're in the city center where you've got, like, if someone tears down a building, you might have some more say as to, like, being, um, trying to fit in with the fabric of that architecture. But, you know, to require that an architect do the work, I think, is just going down a rabbit hole. You know what I'm I saying? Agree. Like, not, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think it's more complicated. Well, I think definitely, it's definitely complicated. It's and very again, complicated. I think, I, and I, we I, don't want to be like, you know, the taste police. Yeah. And I think the, the piece that, that I don't know if it came across last month was the ability for us to, to have some, you know, ability for someone to come in and just like I think Byron Champlin was the one who brought it up regarding the the uh, the place that is in his his area up, up near his house um, where the property is just built right up on the road and there's no front door and there's no windows and we don't have a mechanism in place to say hey you, you can't do this um, and I think that's this is one way to be able to do that. Well, and then maybe it doesn't look bad. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I have a neighbor here in East Concord, and their front door is on the it faces into the side of the lot because that's the only I mean and it's over 100 years old mm -hmm. so I don't know if we can just rubber stamp it and cookie cutter it and this is the way it needs to be and then you have to go to ADR if we're going to do that let's make people go to ADR to do their landscaping you know <laughs> if one wants yeah. to be self-serving like the yeah. architects <laughs> Thank I think it's only, only lots of record that you're going to have those kinds of issues, which there, to be honest, aren't, aren't, I mean, there's not a whole lot out there. Uh, you know, I mean, people come with some really difficult lots because it's not easy to, unless, unless it's like a, things have been passed on in a lineage or whatever. But um, yeah. I, I think, I think some people, some folks concern is like with larger developments, but that's really the easiest situation to deal with. And this, it, it's really when you have a lot of record, because obviously it doesn't affect all the houses that already exist. It would only affect, you know, new construction. Um, but, you know, the, some, of the, some of the stuff that's happened that people have been unhappy with, some of the newer stuff lately, um, you know, that wouldn't have been allowed to happen if we had something in place that said, you know, you need to have your front door here. Because right. he would have come to say, well, I want to put my front door over here. And ADR would have said, well, you know what? You know, the way you've done it is, is not going to work because that's just not, uh, that's not maintaining the character or, you know, the aesthetic value of the streetscape. You know, but if somebody says, you know, I want to put my door over here and you look at it and it's obviously, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't like it. It's what matters. Well, Heather, is do does the consultant have examples of like where they've instituted this and like where's the positive? What do you mean? Where's the positive? Like, I mean, like they they've gone to a community and said, "Oh, we're going to fix this," and then an example of how they embraced that concept of controlling that piece. Yeah, I think that you know they're yes, Who they've, knew? Got, they've worked in communities that are much more developing, much more rapidly, um, and and you see a lot of attempting to maximize, um, you know the financial return sort of at the expense of, of the streetscape. Um, and so I started out this conversation last month saying, you know, the purpose of this is like the whole code update is to make it e easier for people to be more flexible with their property. So, you know, in Concord, there, there's a lot of in place in the code that really makes it very difficult for people to do things without variances. And so, so part of what we're trying to make easier is for them to do things without getting variances. Um, and so to sort of offset that potential adverse impact in, in sort of the downtown neighborhood, I mean, there's two purposes. The one is with the garages in the, RO, in the, in the R20 district is just about having, a, you know, encouraging good design. Um, but in the inner, in the inner neighborhoods, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's more about like making sure we're maintaining that integrity and the aesthetics of the neighborhood in, in areas where, you know, that's what it's designed to, to, um, address like 
when you're saying like why, like what's the positive? That's the positive, Suzanne. If there's if there's a you know somebody who wants to tear down a house or two houses or put additions on their houses, and and they don't really care what it looks like. I mean, we've seen it. We've seen some projects that haven't come through. Literally no windows, and it's just a blank wall. You know, it's just a big box. Uh, so you know that's the kind of stuff that it's helpful to let the architect or the contractor, the property owner know. You know, the standard is that we want there to be a streetscape, you know, a positive impact on the streetscape. Um, so I, I think from a from a design perspective, and and after the meeting last month, um, I had talked to a couple of people, and I know one of the comments was the project that they did at St. Peter's Church. So if if everybody remembers the project, it uh, it has that circular mentality where you've got that open green space in between so if you can imagine that, that that worked well because of the way it was positioned if you can imagine that on pleasant street and uh in and all of the backs of the houses were on pleasant street um and and you had no front doors or you had garages up there and and all of the the real part of the the part of the house was around the the other side. I think that's what you're saying, Heather. Right? Is we've got the ability to to have a, a check and balance to say this doesn't fit into the character of the neighborhood. It's it doesn't have a front door. It doesn't really. There's nothing for us to be able to say you can't do it this way now. If they came to us without a front door requirement, you'd be able to. They would. We wouldn't have a leg to stand on to say you can't do it this way. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just to give a baseline. I mean, what, you know, one person I talked to, she lives up there um, off of Ridge Road, I think, and she was saying, uh, and I was saying, you know, it's it's probably not going to be an issue in these neighborhoods that are really high end, you know, some of the more wealthy neighborhoods, they're going to hire architects, they're going to do things that are going to look really nice. And if they need a design review, it's like, you know, 100 bucks application or something like that, and they go through the process and, and, and they're and they're good. Um, and she was like, no, actually, three of the newest houses in, in my neighborhood are these garage and front houses, and they're terrible, and they shouldn't have been allowed to do that. So, and that was, you know, up there in that neighborhood. So, um, you know, I don't know. We, I, it's difficult because I've gotten a lot of support in both directions. So, yeah. I don't know how the board feels in the majority. I mean, can we do like a roll call or something? Or like, can we say, yeah. yes, I think it's good or no? I so, thought I was coming up with a good thing with the design review because it's a real, it's a, it's I think you are. A lot I of mean, flexibility. I, I was, yeah, but you know, sometimes Heather, there are two people on design review. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes there, when I was on design review, there wasn't like eight people, you know? So we, I, I, we have a, they have, there I, has to be a quorum. I mean, well, I don't know. Sometimes there are two people talking and making a lot of decisions. But it's I ultimately that. the it's board like that. that makes yeah. the decision. I am, yeah. yes, but there's not like, I don't know, is a three a quorum? I don't know. I mean, you're giving a lot of people. I just have a real it's problem. Five. five is a quorum. Well, because you can't tell people what color to paint their house. No. But you also, Why not? But you also already have regulations in place that at some point, we decided it was okay to tell people how tall their house could be. You know, that's, was that the first step on your slippery slope? You know, you, we I, tell them that we, we tell them it can't be more than 35 feet. You know, we tell them there's a lot of things we regulate about private property. Um, you know, and the, all of them are intended to create a certain character and form in a neighborhood. Um, and this is just the same thing. We're not telling people what materials, we're not telling people what colors, we're not telling people what styles. We're just saying we want you to maintain a presence on the streetscape to maintain the, the neighborhood character. Well, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have a problem if there was some, there was more um, fooling around with like the setbacks, you know, why our houses have to be so far, you know, set back so far because of regulations that there could be more flexibility. But I don't know. I have to think more about like really becoming like, you know, if I don't like it, then you shouldn't have it. And yet if people buy these houses, they, they must like their house. I don't know. I just don't know where we should stop well, and how far we should people go. People are just buying what, what there is available too. I mean, right. you have a housing market and there's like one house for sale, you know, <laughs> well, like this I, was, I was thinking that I was, I was looking at public hearing on this too, right? Yeah, there will be. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was looking at some of these houses and I was like, you know, if, if this was the only house, I would buy this house, but I surely would like it a lot better if it, if that garage wasn't there and if it was, yeah. behind, you know what I mean? But I would buy that so, house. So let's, let's try to wrap it up. So let's yeah, look at thanks. it from a, let's look at it from the perspective of exactly what you, what you presented based on the feedback you got from zoning and from the architectural community that uh, we're, we're not in favor of having a glazing requirement regarding uh, front glazing. We are in favor of having the garage set back. We've come to the arbitrary number of six feet. If uh, if that's a good number, that's fine. I, you know, as long as it's not in front, um, I think is is a is the is the piece that the board had a lot of strong feelings on. The sticking point for us seems to be the doors. So um, I'll say, you know, I'm I'm in favor of of giving us the ability to. Um, I don't want to say regulate because that's the wrong word, but uh, you know, put in the put in the stipulation that they have to have a front door. And if they come back to the to the table without the front door, then they need to go through ADR and they need to uh, to get it approved. So, uh, what do you need from us, Heather, as far as just a, a roll call vote to say, you know, everybody kind of say where they want to be, you know, on those three issues. Do you want no glazing, which I think is everybody. I think the no glazing was already, we're already okay, done so with that. So it's just, so it's. Um, it's is that it, a percentage? Okay? It was a percentage. Okay. Yeah. And are you okay with. I think we're with, done with the glazing. So are you, you okay the, with the setback on the garage? And what do you, what's your, what do you want for right. the front doors? Right. May so I ask I a question, please? Yes. yes. I don't understand why. I mean, I don't really think, frankly, it's professional or responsible to have arbitrary, just we've decided it's six feet on the garage setback. I mean, I agree it should be at least six feet back from the facade, but where did we get that number? It yeah. sounds like Liz Hingen thought it was a great number. Was there any basis for any of this? We're we making regulations. At least I haven't heard any basis if there is. And I haven't heard that there. This is what other people do. You know, it just seems we're making arbitrary decisions. No, it's it's not it's not arbitrary. Um, it's well, what's it's, the basis for it? As, as I mentioned earlier, there that was that seemed to be what some of the other precedents that 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 served the purpose that accomplished the purpose were. The twenty feet was intended to give a parking space, be enough parking in front of the garage, so that you wouldn't have to park between you know, your house in the street. And I said, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to solve that. You know, people are still going to park in those locations. I don't think it's worth it to provide like, you know, off street parking next to the house. Uh, but if you want to provide some relief and I have a picture here that I'm trying to find right now, if you want to, if you want to provide some relief, let's see if I can share my screen and, and to without, to without the, to being speak. onerous about the amount of paving, it, and is this what the consultants are recommending? They recommended 20, and that's to provide right, parking park. there. But there, there's two reasons why we're doing it. One is the aesthetics, and for them, the other, there's two reasons why they were doing it. One is for the aesthetics, and the other was to provide a full parking space that does not extend in front of the house. Um, but let me see if I can get this up. But the, if for the aesthetics part, you don't need 20 feet. If you just provide a little bit of relief, a little bit of a, you know, and Liz didn't come up with six feet. I came up with six feet because I looked at a lot of the precedents that served the purpose, that seemed to function the way that we were saying we wanted it to, which was just to show the house as the primary feature. So the house is the primary feature. The garage is the secondary feature, you know, much less than six feet. And you're really not going to notice that it's, that it is set back. Uh, you obviously could do more than six feet if you want, but let me see if I can save here. And I well, think the Trisha, other question Trisha. I have on this is from my perspective, one of the issues in Concord is all the parking on the street. So is there any reason why you wouldn't do 20 feet so that you could have all street parking? You could, if you want, we're not limiting it. You know, if you wanted to, you could, but we're not, no, but I'm asking if you're putting these, if you're putting these conditions in, is that something that the city should be considering? As they look at this, I mean, it just it 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 feels rushed to me. The whole thing. So, can you see this? Yes. Yeah. So this yeah. this is about six feet back, and as you can see, clearly the house is more prominent, and the garage. You know, you could say it looks like it's. Oh, that's six feet it. back. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. 
Maybe it's the angle that I've shown it at, but it is. If and you just if you just think logically too, from a, a six foot setback, to, not in this particular arrangement, but it's not six, far. That's not very much. But six feet would give you enough space to have a a, a door, you know, with a with framing yeah. and a light around it yeah. uh, on either the front or the back. You know, in this case, you'd have a, a six foot space on the back, which would open up to a deck or or you know a patio that's in the back that comes off of the garage. So. Yeah, well, the six the six feet is intended to again provide a little relief on the house, so that there's just a bit of a shadow line, so the house reads as the prominent feature, and the garage reads as the secondary feature, um, and also not take up not take up require too much paving, which I think is a good thing. People express concern about unnecessary paving, and allows you more space in your backyard. Um, I, I think. Too, if you do 20 feet in front, you're pushing the back of that garage much further back than right. the back of the house, which into you might start here. running into setback issues. So yeah. now we're out here doing a whole bunch of waivers for setbacks right. on these narrow, thin lots. Or it just takes up, or it just takes up your space in your backyard. Heather, is there is there a way to do this? Like originally with signs, we had guidelines. Could we do like I've been doing a little bit of like you know on the internet, and they do have design guidelines for residential projects and communities and so you present it as this these are the guidelines remember like we did that on main street this is desirable this is not desirable that's a great idea yeah so the main street guide uh, but again yeah. i think it's it's the teeth it's the teeth that you're looking for heather i think or yeah i mean uh, the, for the, the approval that, process again the people that that want to do a good job they're not, they don't need the guidelines you know then the people that are just don't care if it's not required, they're not going to do it. I mean, I know I've had a couple folks who are or at least well, one that's come prominently to my mind saying like, look, I meet the guy, I meet the regulations. I don't care. I don't want to do that. I don't have to. So, you know, I, I think you're running up against that issue again, of people who are concerned about the aesthetics and they care and it's their own house, you know, that other people who might be developers or, you know, off, you know, they don't live in Concord and they're just, they own a lot of property, you know, they're going to say, oh, that's, that's nice. Those are some pretty pictures, but that's, you know, I don't have to do that. I think having something in place, but having the ability to allow them to not have to get a waiver, but there is some sort of review that allows the flexibility so that the owner feels like they have some relief without a ton of uh, crazy effort from, like you say, having to get an architect, or whatever I think is, seems reasonable. That's I a, that's agree. A, I agree with Jeff. I think something uh, an appeal process that's not too onerous. But it's not even appeal. How do you do just, that? It's not even an appeal. It's just a design review. Like, well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It would have it be the ADR, so that's where they can go and kind of if they if they don't want to have the six feet for whatever reason, or they don't want to have the door there for whatever reason. Maybe they're a corner lot and their house sits on two different streets, and they want the driveway on one and the tour yeah. on another. Yeah. How do you determine which one's best? Well, that, that would be permitted as long as it's... Right, but, but I guess what I'm saying is, is yeah. so as long as they can go through ADR and there is some sort of ability to, uh, quote unquote, appeal to somebody, it's not really an appeal, but, you know, to discuss it and try and get someone to kind of It allows understand. flexibility. Is what exactly. it does is it allows flexibility. So it's not a hard and fast, you must, and there's no way around it. It's, this is what we say, but... If you want to come to us with another option and talk to us, we're willing to listen and possibly I mean, say well, yes. What well, we do no, for hey, Heather, just a second. So that's, I think, Jeff's point is exactly right, which is if if you come to us with a with a really great design, we're going to approve it. But you, we're, it gives us the teeth to be able to say, this looks terrible. It doesn't meet into the streetscape design that we've got now, and we don't we don't approve it. Is what we're missing right now because and what Earl said. I mean, it, you, you know, you want to have that flexibility, but you need to have something that gives us the ability to say you can't no. do that. <laughs> Don't we think this is making us unfriendly like we were unfriendly on the uh, development side for years and, and we're getting a better reputation, but we're not out of it yet. But don't you think this makes us a little bit look like we're a fairly dictatorial, unfriendly community? I, I, I think, think if it's people... presented right, it, I don't think it would, Teresa. I think that I think that it'll be unfriendly to the people that 
want to tell Heather, I don't care if I'm, you know, if I'm, if I'm in regulation and I don't, I'm not required to have a front door, I'm not going to have a front door. So I think from a, if, if we, you know, what made us unfriendly in, in the case of people getting information and then having to jump through hoops and then getting more information and then changing the information, I don't think is the case with this new uh, form-based code. It's going to be very, you know, cut and dry. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can't. And here's how the design process works. So I, I would argue that that it's going to be more friendly, uh, even though there might be different requirements that they're going to have to know and, and figure out how to work with. I think My as long as people is. know up front that this is the requirement, then they don't feel like it's so much arbitrary by the board when they come for on each individual one. They understand these are the rules, but yeah. there's flexibility if there's a condition or a reason to do something different. Yeah, I mean, there's this there's this one development in um, in Concord. I'm trying to find it because it's well. Uh, I don't want like, to. I don't. Yeah. I, I need, I'm going to jump in a minute. On. Oh, yeah, we need to so move on. Gonna, here. Yeah. Uh, you're you're losing me. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to belabor the point. So whatever we need to do, Heather, on the I think we're all in agreement that there needs to be a setback on the garage doors. Um, to Teresa's point on the on the arbitrary nature of a six foot I, I don't know what to say I mean do it's you not need arbitrary to, though I literally no, I know. like I, sort of, pick, not, pictures that look good and I, I said this works yeah, I think I yeah, the that's arbitrary number. that's totally arbitrary I could pick pictures too that look good I think the smallest like I picked the smallest number that created a, a relief you know yeah. Six, so, six feet, if you think about it, like you said, gives you a space for a door or a window yeah. on the side yeah. of that house yeah. before the garage. But that, to me, also just screams, when I look at that house, what do I see? Garage. Yeah. It's I prominent. think that house okay, is Don't look at my too, house. By the way. <laughs> what? I think, that I think house it's the more. angle of the picture because it's straight on. If I had been off to the side a little, you'd see that, you know. Sorry. You, you know, Heather, the only thing the only thing I'm saying, I get what you're doing, and the, and it's it is a pretty house, and the picture is fine. I just am sitting here thinking we're putting things in, as I call it, as regulations that we're just arbitrarily saying, okay, let's do six feet. I agree, you can put a door there. I agree, it's a lot better than what we see down on on what uh, Warren Street or whatever it is with a, that beautiful house it has those horrible garages in front but you can't even see the house but i guess my question is what communities that we want to emulate across the country what are they doing are they doing six feet what downtowns i mean this isn't a downtown but what areas that we what do we want to look like and is six feet right is it 10 feet i don't know well i can come up with a whole you know, I could spend a whole nother month and take, you know, 20 more pictures and say, which do you like best? And we'll go with that number. That's my point, though. I don't know that it's what we like best. I really think it's what, to me, there's a bigger concept here is I know you're trying to say we want to look like an inviting, welcoming community. Well, what really is that? And is that really a house with six feet, a six feet foot setback for a garage or is that you know, what is it and and i was hoping maybe your consultants would have said this is what we recommend and this is why we recommend it and this is because we're getting at whatever the concept is and i think that well, i the think the consultants would do the same thing that i'm doing which is they would they would go look at some precedents and they would say this is a number that works and unfortunately, I'm unable to to show you this. I took pictures of it, and I thought it was on my computer, but I can't find it. But what we don't want is a neighborhood full of garages, and we yeah, have well, those. We have well, neighborhoods just, full of garages. Let me go back a minute. We're paying that consultant a lot of money, and it just seems to me they ought to be coming and giving us recommendations and giving us recommendations for a reason. And I just, just feel like we're, we're being arbitrary which just troubles me. I mean, I'm going to vote no because I'm not comfortable with the situation. And, and you know, even though I really would like to see garages six feet back, but I, I just, I'm just not comfortable with the whole thing. And I'm particularly not comfortable with the front doors, but I, I, I'm just feeling we're, we're being 
I'm feeling like we're ever how many there are of us, nine people or eight people who are making a decision. And what worries me is that's the same thing that's going to happen when somebody goes to the ADR and says, I want to put a door on my door on the side, not the front. And you've got two people there, maybe three people, and there may be people who really don't like side doors. And the person really doesn't have, have any, any control even if they've got a good design. So it just, it just makes me feel like the whole thing's a little arbitrary. Sorry. This one just really bothers me. As That's you can fine. tell. That's right. That's good. That's what we want. We want good, healthy discussion. Yeah. So Heather, how do you want to move forward? Well, like I said, I think we need to take a, a call of the, of the board, you know, to see how everybody feels about it. So the, the, call of the board will be for uh, to require a setback or to, to require a setback with a, a number on it. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Very so the, is, it to, is it to require a setback for the garage or to require a six foot setback for the garage? Um, well, I, I would like to hear from some other people, I guess, like what, what would people support, you know? And then the other one was the front door, right? Right, right. So is that a big sticking point for people? I don't know if we can, we can even do it by hand. You know, do you, do you support having the requirements within or not hands? Cause we got some people that aren't on, on video, but uh, yeah. do we support? I can come on video. No, that's fine. No, you can stop. Do we have a, do we have, <laughs> I have a, on my pajamas, but that's okay. No, that's fine. Do we have a, uh, <laughs> do we have any consensus regarding the front door aspect? Uh, do we want to say that, you need to have a front door. I mean, we could say nothing. We could come back and say, we don't want to have a requirement for uh, window glazing, which we don't. We don't want to have a requirement for, for front doors, and we don't want to have a requirement on, on garages. I just don't know where everybody stands. So This might be sound like a weird question, but could the front door issue also be related to safety with the fire department having easy access rather than having to go around the side of a house? Yeah, We've talked about that before, but I mean, I think that you know, fire would be fine with either. Ultimately, it's, it's, it has to be the visible. Out. They have their own requirements. So. That's fine. I just not having been here last month, I didn't fully understand. So I'm trying to kind yeah. of run so up to speed as quick as possible. They have their own building code requirements that have to be met, and so um, it, we're not gonna we're not gonna you know over plan for fire when they have their own requirements. I heard that, Earl. <laughs> I mean, I could just say, okay, front door. Yes, front door on the street. Yes. You know, yes or no, would uh, Rich? Yeah, yes. I, 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 I would like to have the ability to to approve or deny that. So, yes, I'll say okay. I want to see if uh, can, can I just ask Heather one question, one more question? Where is this in the full report? You mean in the in the quote in, in the, the study code? from the consultant? This is a component, correct? Right. Is this the most important component, or is it? No, it's just one case. that there's been hasn't been consensus on. So, would it be awful to like come up with like design guidelines so that people can respond to them and then add on to this? I mean, this is a big change, the whole, the process that you're undertaking, which is needed, but this seems to be more aesthetic and aesthetics is hard to, um, it's like, I like red, well, you like blue, you know, it's very, it's much more difficult to determine. So why couldn't we just like tiptoe into this piece of it and come up with guidelines that people can respond to and see if that's enough? Because then, you know, I would say, like, there should but Honestly, be that's not going to happen for, like, that wouldn't happen for, like, five years. Because we don't have the staff or the resources and we have to... Well, maybe we wouldn't need it. I don't know how bad it is now. But anyway, I, you know, we have to move on, but... Yeah, yeah we're way past moving on. We need I just to, need, we need, to, I just need to get some consensus on what, what we have here. And if everybody just says no, then we'll figure out what the other answer could be. But, um, I mean, I kind of would just like to go through... You know, Rich, your your yes on the front door. Yeah, and what I about don't know the, about the I don't know about the setback. I mean, I've heard you know the six foot number. I'm fine with the six foot number. I definitely want to see a setback. I just don't know what the number is. Okay, 
Uh, yeah. May I ask a question just for a minute before we go any further? The question I have is, what I don't understand is why Suzanne's situation would take five years, but we can put this in in two months. I don't quite understand. We've why. been working on this for five years. <laughs> We've been working on this for yeah. years. We've had why, couldn't we take, why couldn't we take what your proposals are and make them guidelines and see if people adhere to them? If they do, we don't have a problem. If they don't, then you then you got to go we back. We do have them. architectural design guidelines on our list of things that we need to do. And it's like proposed like five years out because once we get this accomplished, the next step is to do phase two. And then after that, which we're already delinquent on is master plan update. And so we need to do a transportation plan update. We need to do historic resources plan update. Um, you know, these are all things that are like behind in terms of what we need to get accomplished. So it's, it's just something that would have to be sit on the back burner until we accomplish all this other stuff. We just don't have, um, you know, I've already got the, my budget that I'm asking for, for, how, for the next however long to get through the master plan update. So just remind me, because I should know this, but I really don't. What is pushing this whole initiative? Who or what? Well, I think that, you know, what I've been, what I've been trying to communicate is the zoning update is intended to make it easier for people to do what they want to on their lots. And so as to offset potentially a lot of, a, a, a lot more adverse um, development because people are going to be incentivized to some degree to, if they, if they want to, people, you know, there's a few people who are just waiting for this to pass so that they can, you know, remodel a bunch of stuff or tear down a bunch of stuff or snatch up a bunch of properties. You know, if you're going to make it easier for people to develop or to utilize their property, um, you know, it's not all going to be stuff that, that you, that you like, you know, you, you may make an environment where, you know, you're not covering all your bases, um, you know, things are happening that, it, that, that you're not going to be happy with in the neighborhood. So this is an attempt to, off, to offset, give some controls for aesthetics to, to make sure that while you're, in, you know, incentivizing this, you're also putting things in place to maintain the characters of your neighborhood. So again, it goes to the points that we made originally, which were way back when we first started talking about form-based code was, you know, that increase in density. So that single family yeah. house that's there now, all of a sudden it's going to be a two or three family house and they're going to remodel yeah. it and they're going to take the front door off and they're going to put it on the side. And, well, there, and there've already I been, just, there've I, already I, I been houses. Stop, I want to stop asking questions and I want yeah. to stop. I, want I, mean, to get I just want this. to see there, there already have been houses that people have been really unhappy with in their neighborhoods and how many is enough before we say, you know what, we really need this in place. And what if that never happens in your neighborhood? Right. You know, are you never going to want to support it because it never happens in your neighborhood and it's just all in these other neighborhoods that people are doing these types of things? So, so I mean, I, again, at what point? At what point does it become like, hey, right, we have a we have we have a problem to fix? I'm sensitive to all the questions regarding uh, it being too fast, it being arbitrary, it being you know, something that we don't want to, they don't, we, that we don't want to make a mistake on. And I, I do have the impression that it's, hey, by, this gives us some ability to, to go back and, and make changes or, or do things that we, we might have missed before. So I, the world's know, not going to end if we don't do this. Are uh, we better off? I was just going to say, are we better off? The world's not, not going to end if we this? don't do this. We can just say, but, it, but again, I would like to get through the board to see who is in support. Right. I've only gotten through me every time. And I know. Got, so... <laughs> Okay, continue on. To see. Um, anyway, Jeff, you are next on my list. I have to go downstairs and do my Christmas stockings yeah, with the kids. It's time for bed. <laughs> so do you want to give us your response, Earl? You want to go first? Uh, sure. I, uh, you know, I, I think we said it a little bit before. I'm, I've been on this board for two years and we make recommendations all the time on colors of signs and where they should go and how they're illuminated. And I understand that's on the commercial side of the house, but when it comes to the streetscape, and I think I said this last month, I'd rather make sure every house has a front porch because I think that's critical to have a, a neighborhood, but that's not what we're talking about. I, I'm happy with these uh, suggestions as long as there's a way for a, a, a residential builder or someone that's building their home to go in and say, I have a good reason why I don't want my door on the front of the house. So that said, 
I, I'm happy going forward with these. Um, I, I don't see this as a huge issue. Uh, I've heard a lot of examples of, of houses that have already been built and, and they're not part of this unless they go to decide they want to change something. So the, the short answer is I, I'm okay going ahead with this because guess what? I'm going to have this conversation when it comes to the city council. <laughs> We're going to do this all over again. But I think this is part of good planning and it's, it's a good discussion to have. So I, I'm supportive of passing it, of going forward with it. I'll go back to you, Jeff. Here, uh, I'm going in order of my, my book. That's okay. Yeah, um, I, I agree totally with Earl. As long as there's a way about I don't think it's an issue to say the regulation is you must have a front door on the street. I think that six feet is a person, personally, I think is a reasonable number for a setback. I think less doesn't really do you any good too far, and it can cause other issues. But the fact that having some sort of relief, you know, being able to talk to somebody about it and, and a get a different opinion and, and, and go forward. I'm, I'm good for both. Okay. Uh, Matt. Um, same as last month. I think the door needs to be in the front. I don't at all think, I don't at all think it's cookie cutter. I, I just, I think people still have a lot of, uh, you know, they have a lot of possibilities what they can do. I think the garage should be farther than six feet back. I actually, like the consultant idea of 20, but it's probably a little extreme. So I'll go with the, uh, the setback of some distance, six feet minimum. Carol? Um, I'm fine with the six feet. I'm, I'm a little squeamish about the front door, but because I think front doors on the side of the house can work, that said, it would, if you're going to have the front door on the side of the house, then you need to have windows on the street side. So I'm fine going with, you've got to have it on the front unless you go through a process, because that process would figure out what the street side of the house would look like. So I think, I think having it on the front, um, unless you do some sort of consultation is the best way around that. Okay, thank you. We kept, we started losing your, your it came in and out. Uh, oh, we, sorry. We heard, we heard most we of what you said. Yeah, so we got you. it. Um, John? Well, I just have 20 questions before I give, no, I'm just kidding you. <laughs> uh, I, I think they're, they're both reasonable design standards to go as a companion with the, with the upcoming, you know, zoning changes. Um, I, I could. I mean, I agree with Earl, and I agree with with uh, with Rich. I don't think it's particularly onerous, so I, I would support going forward with. Uh, and I think I like the changes that you made that gave it an alternative. That if somebody didn't do that, there was a, a way to reasonably uh, come in with a uh, alternate uh, design. Um, Dave, it's you, Dave. David. Hi. <laughs> You're watching TV, aren't you? You're almost done. You're almost done, David. I'm watching this group. I agree with you. I, I agree with the front door, and I agree with the setback. I'm, I'm you know, on both okay. counts. Uh, Suzanne. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I'm, ha I'm really struggling with this because I, I mean, I, I was, I'm trying to find examples of residential design standards, and, and I think that. You, you have to look at the whole picture. Like, how are you actually going to let people know what these standards are and how are they put into our regulations? I mean, it's a bigger picture than a front door. You know, I would say, I think three car garages should be outlawed. Well, that's my opinion, but it's not necessarily a design standard. So there are things that you're saying that I agree with. I just really need to feel more comfortable with how are we actually going to manage this? How do we actually integrate this into our regulations? What does it really look like? Because I don't think you you have to have, you could mandate an architect doing, hiring an architect to do your house. Yeah. So there are a lot, there are all these little pieces. So I'd rather abstain, but I, 
I like the idea, except I feel uncomfortable just saying random things that we would like to see. I would rather see like, how does this really look? How is this a working document that we actually can incorporate into our building codes or our, our, our aesthetics? I don't know. Well, abstention is fine. So if you don't, that's fine. And you'll get another crack at it once it comes back as a, as a complete plan to be able to look at it. Yeah. I mean, I want to be able to offer like some concrete suggestions, but I, I think, you know, there are, there are communities in the United States that regulate everything when it comes to architecture no, we don't want to do that. and design, but we don't want to do that. So I don't know if I've given you an answer, but Heather, I'm, I'm emailing you something to look at. Okay, thank you. Okay. And Teresa, I have you down for two no's. <laughs> so if you want to ex expand, you please go do so. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm totally a no on the garages. However, again, it just, it, it, I'm just uncomfortable with the whole thing. So you can leave me as no's or uncomfortable, whatever. Okay. Perfect. I do like Suzanne's idea of uh, uh, guidelines, but. And you'll get yeah. a you'll get a crack at looking at it again. So, yeah. okay, I'm going to move on. I Heather, like the I'm idea also. You, I'm not going to let you talk anymore, Heather. I'm going to let I'm going to move on to say, <laughs> is there any other business that would legally come before the board, or we'll give Jeff the ability to make a motion to adjourn since it's his first meeting. And Jeff, this was a short one without a lot of topics. So, congratulations yeah. on attending a nice quick meeting. Thanks Welcome. for getting us out of here so soon, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jeff. We yeah, appreciate well, I'm the new guy, like I said in the very beginning. <laughs> well, Merry Thank Christmas, everybody. everybody. I really appreciate Merry it. Merry Christmas. Thank yes, you. Merry Christmas. So, Happy New Year. Yeah, have a nice holiday, everybody. Okay, yeah, So thanks. I will make yeah, a motion to adjourn. Okay, then, so, so we've got a second. motion to adjourn, and End we've got second. a second. Yeah. All those in favor with a nice hand up there, everybody? Yeah. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Take evening. Have a great holiday. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks all. Bye. Bye. Bye.